Upsy administration and some with asset management. Um, to go over a few housekeeping items, um, I will tell you today is the first time in two years that we've actually had people in the class. So those of you at home, if you um, have a question, you will submit your questions to compliancehelp at nchfa.com, which is shown on the screen. That's where you will submit your questions. If you're actually here today, if you have a question, raise your hand. Um, we will repeat your question so the people that are watching virtually will know what your question is. So um, again, just know that there are people here in person as well as virtually for today. But again, please ask your questions because if you have a question, most definitely somebody else probably has the same question. And also it um, makes the day go by faster as, as it's more interactive. If you are watching virtually and you have technical difficulties on your screen, there is a phone number that you should call. That number is not to our office. That number is to someone here at the McKimmon Center that can help you with technical issues as it relates to getting hooked up. They cannot help you with internet issues, phone issues, anything of that nature. But if you're having trouble get, getting connected, reach out to that number and they can help you. But again, make sure that you're submitting your questions um, through compliance help if you have those. The way that we will do those for the people that are um, watching virtually is at the end of each section, we will check that email address and then we will repeat any questions that have been submitted and then we will answer those. So again, um, just know that we won't answer those until the end of each section. A couple other housekeeping items. Um, typically, our um, break is about 10.30. Um, we usually take a 15-minute break then. Then we will do lunch, which will be on your own, obviously, from 12 to 1.30. Um, and we do that for a little bit longer for those that are here in person. Since there is not um, food here at the facility, they'll have a chance to get out, get lunch, and get back. So, again, we will start back at 1.30 versus our normal 1 o'clock. Um, for those of you that are here in person, um, if you have questions about things that are in the area, places to go, let us know at the break. We can let you know some good places to go. Um, but And then the afternoon, I think the break is usually about 2.30, 2.45. And we typically end around 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. So that's kind of the housekeeping items. For those of you that are here in person, if you're looking for a restroom, if you'll go out the door and turn to your left, right straight ahead, on the right will be restrooms um, for women. And then I think to the right at the other end of the hallway are restrooms for men. But on any of the long hallways here at the McKimmon Center, there are restrooms. So um, when I came in this morning, there was not a lot of people here, so that should not be an issue as far as getting into a restroom. But should you need a restroom, just know on any of the um, hallways there are facilities. So um, that, I think, takes care of the housekeeping items. So I will go, um, go ahead and start our presenting. What I will say before I get started is that Louise Gardner from the Housing Finance Agency will be presenting today, as well as Wanda Teal from the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm sure all of you at some point in time are familiar with them, but they will be up here presenting it as well throughout the day. The first thing that I'm going to cover are some hot topics. These are things that we um, are typically new, and we want people to make sure that they pay attention to these because these are things that may have changed or are new going forward. First and foremost, things that have changed about your certificate. Everybody wants the certificate at the end of class. In order to get the certificate, you must complete the survey. That is part of completing the class. So at the end of this um, session, probably within the next two or three days, you will get an email asking you to complete the survey. As soon as you complete the survey, the system will automatically generate your certificate through to your email. If you do not complete the survey, you do not get a certificate. So part of your homework assignment after today is look for the email in order to do the survey so you can get the survey. Again, as far as for those of you that are participating virtually, of course, we ask that you not share the link. So only the person that signed up and paid for the class will get credit for the class, no, many, no matter how many times you've shared that link. Um, the McKimmon Center will let us know, for those of you that are virtually, what time you signed in and what time that you signed off and everything in between as far as your viewing time. You do have to view at least 85 to 90 percent of the presentation in order to get credit for the class. So make sure that you are um, participating and not signing in or shuffling back and forth so you can make sure that you get credit for the class. So that will impact your ability to get your certificate. We have had people contact our office and say, you know, I attended virtually but I didn't get the certificate. Well, if you didn't stay signed in for at least 85 to 90 percent of the presentation, you do not get credit. So make sure that that is not an issue for you. 
Again, questions regarding the survey or the certificate can be sent to Karen Williams in our office and we do provide her email address. So again, give it about two or three days and then you should start seeing the emails for the surveys in order to get your certificates. Talk a little bit about leases. For those of you that have loans from our agency, in the past, we would have to approve your lease. You'd have to send your lease into us. We would make sure that it met the requirements for the tax credit program and any other funding source you had, such as home or housing trust fund. Well, because everybody had a different lease and there were different requirements, we were looking for certain things. So a couple years ago, I think back in 2019, our agency put out a tax credit lease addendum as well as a home lease addendum. Those addendums have the required language that we need them to have. So now we're not going to approve your lease per se. You send us your lease, upload it in RCRS, as well, and the, the last two pages of that lease should be the tax credit lease addendum and the home lease addendum if it applies. Not every property has home, but if you have home, you need to make sure your residents are signing both of those addendums. So when you upload your lease to us, if your lease is five pages, you're gonna upload a total of seven pages, possibly if you have home funds, you upload all of those pages to your lease to, and, and our system, and we are, we are approving that. What we are approving is that you acknowledge that your residents, in addition to your lease, must sign those two documents. Those have to be on the file. So keep that in mind. Those are the documents that we're looking at. We're not actually going through your lease and looking at every paragraph and every um, thing that you have in there to ensure that you have everything because we're in, um, counting on the lease addendums that we have required to take the place of that. So again, make sure that when you upload your lease that you're including the applicable addendums. Not everybody will have the home lease addendum, so if you don't have home at your property, you don't need to upload that. For those of you that are responsible for the annual owner certification, you know that those are due February the 10th, which is tomorrow maybe. So if you have not submitted your annual owner certification, it is due by to, um, the 10th. If you do not submit it by the 10th, it is considered late and you will be issued an 8823. So make sure that you get those in. However, the one thing that I will caution you to do is that make sure that the information that you have entered in RCRS is accurate and that you have entered information for every one of your households for 2021 because when the owner signs that document they are certifying that RCRS is true accurate and correct once you submit the annual owner sir you do not have the ability to make corrections the only way for you to be able to make corrections is for us to reject the annual owner cert, which then generates an 8823 so make sure your data is correct we know that many of you are working um, tirelessly to try to make sure that's correct because we've had many of you call us over the last couple of weeks to say that. Some of you submitted your AOC early. Our team is already reviewing those. We have discovered that RCRS is not correct. So we have sent it back to you. And what happens when they send it back to you is they essentially delete it and you have to start over. So hopefully um, if yours was returned to you, you can get those corrections made and get that submitted back before the deadline of the 10th to avoid the 8823. If you have questions regarding the 8823, you can reach out to Lisa White or to Tanya Clark. And I believe in the front of your book, I can't swear to it, there should be a contact list. If there's not, at the break, I can give you either one of their um, email address to let you know the, the exact person who you need to contact directly. Okay, for those of you that work on site, of course, you know, um, we are, have resumed physical inspections and our team is coming back out doing physical inspections. In the past, we have used the UPCS um, guidelines for inspections and that is what we currently use now. There is some discussion that HUD will be putting out a new um, guideline that we should be using and it's known as INSPIRE. Um, so some of the things that are gonna change when that gets implemented is that it's gonna prioritize health and safety and functional defects over the appearance of the property. Right now, we're actually doing um, five inspectable areas when we're doing your inspections. Of course, that's your dwelling units, your um, building systems, your common areas, your exterior, and your site. So there are five things that determine if your property passes inspection. Well, once they change over to Inspire, you notice that you have three areas. That's gonna be the actual inside the unit, um, the common areas and then outside. 
there's going to be more weight given to the actual units. So make sure that you're prepared to address any needs inside your unit, not just on the site picking up the trash when this changes. The last that we had heard from HUD, it was originally supposed to be implemented in 2020, then it moved to 2021, and then because of COVID, it's been pushed back. So I think the last call that I was on that I heard anything about, it will maybe 2023. So right now we are still using UPCS, so make sure you're following those rules. But if that changes, we'll let you know, but that's where we're at with the um, change to the inspection protocol. One of the changes that we implemented in 2021 is that we will no longer allow you to make repairs during an inspection. In the past, when we would get to your property to do an inspection, typically the manager and the maintenance technician and sometimes your regional would go out to the unit with us to do the inspection. Um, first thing, during COVID protocol, only three people can go in the unit. That's our inspector and two people on your team. So make sure that you're aware of that because oftentimes there's owners or different people that show up and everybody wants to go in the unit. Our team will work with you the best they can to allow you to switch out the team members, but only three people can go into the unit. And if you're going in the unit, there's a job that you have to do, so we need you to make sure that you're helping um, turn on the eyes and things of that nature to help the inspection flow. In the past, when your maintenance technician would go, sometimes they'd have a bucket with them and they'd have a few outlet covers and maybe a few batteries for the smoke detector. And as long as they can get those things fixed while we were in the unit, we noted that they repaired it while we were there, but it was not non-compliance. As of September of last year, you cannot make repairs during the inspection. Now, having said that, if your maintenance technician wants to do that, that's fine, but we're still going to note it as non-compliance. You can't make repairs during the inspections going forward. So um, just keep that in mind. This is, of course, to avoid any delays into the inspection. Um, it helps address any deferred maintenance that management or owners may put off. And so, again, we're going to note that as non-compliance if we go in and find it. So keep that in mind. Let your maintenance team and your staff know that because that um, has come up as a topic of conversation during their um, inspections this year. Well, you used to let me, so that was a change as of last year. Okay, for those of you that work on site and work in compliance, you know that owners have the ability to elect average income. We are not going to go into great detail about average income, but we will talk a little bit about it here. I strongly encourage you that if your property has average income, you need to make sure that you sign up for our compliance classes where we talk about that in more detail. Average income is essentially another income band that the IRS has allowed owners to elect. Our agency did not allow you to start making that election until 2014 going forward. And essentially, um, that means those properties are starting to come online in 2021. If you want to know what the requirements are for that, you can look at our QAP, which that's basically the rule book every year. So if your property gets allocated credits in 2020, make sure that you're reading the QAP for that year. And we don't allow you to choose more than four income bands. So that can have anywhere from 20 to um, 80, but you can only choose four of those. You know, in the past, it was either um, 20 at 50 or 40 at 60. Now you have the ability to choose 20 up through 80%. We are monitoring this annually. So this means that you're going to see us every year doing physical inspections and file audits. Whereas before, if you had just straight tax credits and no other funding from us, you only saw us every three years. If you elect average income, we are coming every year. Again, attend our advanced training because it is covered in more detail and it'll help you better understand that. All right, so what we're gonna do is um, talk a little bit about how that impacts the targeting program. Of course, you're still going to be reaching out to DHHS at least 120 days prior to getting your CO. That's allowing DHHS to start the referral process, which we'll talk more about later today, and also help you get your units leased prior to getting your CO. So once you get the CO, you can sign leases and everybody can move in. Again, all of your vacant units have to be um, given to DHHS at the initial lease up and make sure you talk to them before you enter. If your property has 80 units, you're only required to give DHHS 10% of your units. So that's eight units. You do not need to enter all 80 units in vacancy and referral. When you reach out to DHHS, they're gonna talk about the makeup of your property as it relates to unit size and their referral list, and they will let you know what size units that they need and which ones to go ahead and enter. 
So you only you're only going to enter them eight to start with, but then at least up. I mean, it, um, when the unit turnover, you may do more. But again, reach out to them and they can let you know what's the best way to do that. We do encourage you to develop a tracking system for these set asides to make sure you maintain compliance, because if you have a unit come available and it's an 80% set aside and you haven't met your targeting requirement, you still have to offer that unit to DHHS. So keep that in mind. All right, so we're gonna talk, um, uh, kind of go through an example. At this particular property, you have one bedrooms and two bedrooms, and you notice that the rent limit is 400 for 30% and 900 for an 80%. This is assuming the property has elected um, 30 and 80% income bands. All right, and you see that the key payment standard is $520 on a one bedroom and $620 on a two bedroom. Okay, so if I have not met my targeting requirement and a 30% unit comes open, how much rent can I charge? All right, the most that you can charge is 520 because the targeting program has a payment standard of 520. If it was not somebody in the targeting program, the most that you could charge would be the 400. So you're getting the benefit of the higher rent on those lower set asides. Okay, but so what happens if somebody moves in, you haven't met your, somebody applies, you haven't met your targeting requirement and an 80% unit comes open? How much can you charge then? The most that you can charge is $620 because that is the key payment standard. All right, you notice the rent limit on that. If it was somebody coming into your property that is not part of the targeting program, you could collect $900. So you're taking a haircut on that set aside. That's why it's very, very important to make sure that you're tracking them because you have to offer all of your set asides to DHHS. They don't pay you more because it's an 80% unit. They only pay their um, key payment standard. Again, that's very basic, very simple. Um, about the um, average income. I strongly encourage you to attend um, the advanced training where they go into that in more detail, where they talk about the property as a whole, how they're um, checking your average as it relates to unit size, all of that, not just the income. There are um, some required forms that you should be using for the targeting program. If you're at our website, which is nchfa.com, you see this is the front page that you sign up at. Over on the right hand side, it says rental housing partners. You'll click there and then you will drill down and go to rental owners and managers because those are the forms that you're looking for. And when you get there, this is the, what the screen will look like. Over on the left hand side, it'll say policies, resources and forms. That's where you will go. And then you'll see the forms are broken out to whether it's an owner and management form um, or resident files. So of course, you're gonna be looking for the ones for owners and managers and the ones that they would be using. And when you go there, you see that there is a section for the DHHS targeting program. All of your documents are listed there. And you'll notice to the right of some of those, there's an updated date to where if we have updated the form, that'll be the most um, current version of the form. So you can get your forms here. So again, make sure that you are using this as a resource, so you'll make sure that you have the right forms because if you're not using the most current forms and you submit a file, we will have to return those. The other thing that I will point out is that um, members of our team work really hard to develop the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency's compliance manual, and that is also found on that policies, resources, and forms link. We, do, we did not print that. You're welcome to print it if you would like. I know some people are still old school and they wanna have a paper copy that they can put um, tabs on and move back and forth. This is where you would go to print that. I think it's like 85, 90 pages, both sided. Again, encourage you to use that as a point of reference, but that is where you find that document. All right, and then um, two of the most common forms that we see that are not the correct version is the um, key calculation worksheet and the key lease addendum. Again, we've pointed that out on our website where you can find that to make sure that you're using the um, most recent version of that. Of course, um, hopefully we're on the backside, but we're still in the COVID environment. Um, there are certain things that we have done at our agency in order to um, live with COVID and kind of adjust some of our policies. 
on our website, you can go to um, check for any updates that we have to our policies and stuff as a result of COVID. Um, one of those things that we've changed is the number of people that can go in a unit during inspection is now just three. So again, you can find all of those updates there. Um, again, if you have questions about the guidance or if, if it's not on there and you have a question, reach out to our team. We'll be more than happy to help you um, make sure that you're on the right path as it relates to that. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Violence Against Women's Act, also known as VAWA. Make sure that you're collecting the required forms at the right times. And you need to make sure that you have those posted on your office in your office on the bulletin board as it relates to the model emergency transfer plan. You have to have an emergency transfer plan posted when our staff come out to do a physical inspection. They are looking for that as well as your tenant selection plan to make sure that it's posted on the bulletin board. It needs to be posted on a bulletin board that people that come in or your residents can see. It should not be on a bulletin board behind your desk because most people that come to your property to apply for a property, you would not anticipate that they would be back rummaging around your desk looking for things. So I would hope not anyway. That's kind of in your personal space. So again, make sure it is at a place that's accessible and that people know because we don't know what we don't know. And if we don't know that one exists, we wouldn't know to ask for it. So just make sure it's posted on a bulletin board that if they come in, they could just glance up there and see what you actually have up there. The VAWA forms do not have to be uploaded in RCRS, but you are expected to have those in the file. And how we check for that is when we come out to do a physical inspection, we're looking to see if you've got your model transfer policy posted on your bulletin board. And then we're asking the manager about their VAWA forms. If they know what they're talking about and they start telling us, then yes, we know they're doing it and everything's good. You check that off. If the manager kind of looks at us like they don't know what we're talking about or they tell us, hey, I'm new, I just started yesterday, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, we ask them to give us their most recent tenant move-in file. Forms are in there. We kind of explain to them the purpose of the forms. We check it off. You're doing it. It's in the file. If it's not in the file, we notify the manager, hey, this is what you're supposed to be doing, and we note it as part of the physical inspection. So again, just make sure it's in the file so we can see it when we come out to do our inspections. Something else new that we're doing, um, we've been doing it the last couple of years, but um, it's more in the forefront now, is we're doing um, tracking of your um, project's construction and we're doing pre-lease up calls. So we are working with our development team as, as construction goes along. And once you get to a certain part in your construction, we are reaching out to the management company and scheduling a pre-lease up call. Usually that's usually within 120 days of CO so make sure that the person that we're calling, if they're not the person that we're supposed to be talking to, making sure they're sending that information on. Because we like to do this 120 days out that makes sure people know what the expectation is as it relates to the targeting program, some other things that may impact your compliance. You know, do you have your tenant selection policy approved? Do you have your um, utility allowance updated? All of these things that need to be in the system. It's kind of like, okay, here are the things we need to check off to make sure most importantly, do we have your bank account information so you can get paid for the targeted households? So we're checking all of these things during the pre-lease up call. If you wait until a week before, you're kind of behind the eight ball. So again, when our staff's calling, and typically that's Amy Barnes or Louise Gardner, when they're calling to set up these calls, just get with them. You know, they'll ask you, you know, these are the dates that I have. Do these work with you? And they'll do the call. They usually last about 30 minutes, maybe longer if it's a new management company or you've got a new manager on the call but they don't take very long most of you are seasoned you've done this before it's just you know introduce who i am make sure you know what you're missing you know make sure you know what make sure you can let us know what we're missing because there are times that we're missing things and get to know everyone and so you can transition to dhhs all right so typically a little bit about how that works is of course the qap comes out which is known as the qualified allocation plan and the building um, property is in various stages of construction, all right? Once it, we're starting to track construction, our development team is letting them know, you know, if they're doing site work, if it's at slab and foundation, if it's at framing, all right? Once they tell us that the property is at the mechanical stage, all right, that means that Amy from our office is going to reach out to somebody at your office and ask them to um, com complete the property characteristics sheet. 
what you're going to put on this form. Now, she provides you the form. You just need to fill it out. You're going to tell her where the closest grocery store is, how many miles it is from various things, um, family or elderly, um, the address, the phone number, all of these things, okay? Because a lot of times the address that we have on file is at the corner of 1st and 2nd Street. Well, that's because of construction. You don't get your address from the post office until later on. So you're going to give us the correct address. So A, if somebody calls us, and we can tell them your actual address. And if our team is coming out to do an inspection, they know how to get to your property. So then management's going to complete this form, and they're going to send it back to Amy. Amy's going to use the information on that sheet and complete a property profile sheet. That property profile sheet is, in essence, an overview of your property. And then that sheet's going to be given to um, DHHS. They're going to use the information on that sheet to determine the referrals that they have if they're a good fit for your property. You know, obviously, you know, they're not going to be able to tell everything from that sheet versus, you know, who the referral is. But if you tell them on the property profile sheet that there's no public transportation near there, if somebody wants to live at your property, they need to know either you need to have a car or be prepared to Uber or ride share or something, you know. And that's the sort of thing that if nobody's been to your property before, which is probably DHHS or our staff, we wouldn't know that there's not a bus stop close by or things like that. So that's the importance of that form and why a lot, oftentimes people say, God, Amy's worrying me to death about that form. I mean, what is the big deal? That's the big deal about that form. So make sure that you get that form completed and back timely so we can get that to DHHS. Again, you're doing this 120 days before CO. Hopefully DHHS can use that information to get you good referrals and get them there timely. So when you get your CO, you're doing a mass lease signing the next day. All you're doing is giving out keys, people signing paperwork. You're not still trying to get referrals. Now again, that's a perfect world scenario, but the longer you wait, the longer it takes DHHS to get you referrals. And they still have 120 days after CO, but anything that you can get done prior to that, that's avoiding um, money loss for units not leased. So again, reach out to Amy. Again, if you have questions, need help filling out that form, if you can't reach Amy, you can reach Louise or myself. We'll be more than happy to help you with that. But that's why that form is so important and why you feel like Amy's called me again today about this form. Why does it matter how far the grocery store is? You know, that's the reason for that. All right, so then once Amy lets me know that they are at that stage, then I'm sending out the OAP and the targeting unit agreement, which is the owner agreement to participate, which means they're giving us permission to put money in their bank and take it back if we give them too much. And then the targeting unit agreement is the document they have agreed to sign to participate in the targeting program. All right, those documents have to be on file in order for us to make payment. All right, money is good. When we send those out, we send those out to the people that are, you know, a lot of times the authorized official in the management company that can sign those, and then they send those back to us. We have them available in RCRS, but we send them an email and say, here are the forms, here's where you go step by step to get them. Please print these forms off. Please have the management company sign and the owner sign because every, both people have to sign the targeting unit agreement and then upload them back in RCRS. In addition to that, you need to give us a voided check, so we'll know where to put your money at, your W-9, and the letter from the IRS that shows us the information about your taxpayer ID information. All of that, explicit instructions in the email, all right? So make sure if you're the new property manager or you're at a site, you're like, did you do this? I know you're supposed to do it. I know I'm not supposed to do one, but if you don't do it, we can't get paid. All right, if you're in RCRS and you think you should be able to have the option to select key assistance for a household and you don't, that's the reason you don't have the option to do that. It's because we don't have that information. Because once you get it to us, our finance team has to approve it and get you a vendor number. So all of these things impact other people in the process, so make sure that we get those. So once Amy lets Louise know, okay, they've got me the sheet, this is where we're at, Louise is calling to talk to typically the regional manager and the site staff to kind of touch base with them for the pre-lease up call. So that's where Louise is coming in at. So Louise has this call. She talks to make sure that you know what the targeting program is. She goes over again where to find the documents. Um, make sure that you understand all right, your property elected average income. Make sure you know what that is. Make sure that you know 
all right, we don't have your um, targeting unit agreement or your tenant selection plan, you need to make sure somebody's getting it to us. This is another time for us to touch base and say, okay, we've been reaching out to Lisa to get this and then come to find out, oh, Lisa's not the person. She probably doesn't know what you're talking about, so she's just deleted your email. You need to be sending it to Katie. You know, we're all guilty of that. You know, they must have sent that to the wrong person, you know. So, again, that's another place that we touch base. Make sure you know who you should be reaching out to DHHS. A lot of times y'all tell us, oh, yeah, we've already talked to them. You know, we're moving forward, da, 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 da. Again, this is just kind of closing all of the loops. So they're very, very important. They are a requirement. This is not optional. I can tell you that this past, into last year, I think, there um, was a management company that had two or three properties coming online at the same time. It is not ideal that we do them at the same time because not every property makes the same elections as it relates to set-asides because we talk about that specifically. We will do that if necessary, but we do not like to do that because a lot of times the manager that's going to be at this property is not the same manager that's going to be at this property. And if I start talking about average income for this property, the person down the street's like, what are they talking about? Or they get down the street and start working. Well, Sandy said on this call I got to do it. Well, no, that was for somebody else. So, again, we like to do them um, property specific, but we can, if necessary, do them um, for everybody. All right, again, some things that Louise is looking for. You know, have you got all your buildings entered in RCRS? You got to make sure you got your units in there. Has your utility allowance been submitted? Your tenant selection plan, OAP and the TUA, we talked about that. The direct deposit authorization, one of the big things that we see with that is you fill out the form, but you don't give us a voided check. They got to have a voided check to make sure that what you wrote on the form matches the actual account. All right, um, again, we talked about how you'll be notified going forward to do this, and the things that we talked about. If we have not reached out to you, and you know it's about 120 days out, pick up the phone and call us. That may mean that our construction team hasn't updated the information, so we don't know yet. So you're at your property, your boots on the ground, you know more about what's going on. So again, don't hesitate to call us and say, well, I know you said 120 days, but can we go ahead and do this now? Because this is how this is going to happen. More than happy to work with you. So again, reach out to Amy, myself, or Louise. Any of us, if it's not we're not, not something that we would do, we would reach out to the other one because we have calls every two weeks where we talk about the construction tracking and kind of where everybody's at because everybody's got a different piece to this and they're not always connected to make sure that we're all on the same page. That way if somebody's called me and I forgot to tell Louise, I'm like, oh yeah, they called, we need to do that. So don't hesitate to give any of us a call. Okay, that looks like the last slide before the next section and I did not bring my phone up here. So Louise, are there any questions from this section? Yes, yes. Um, someone submitted that they were having buffering issues, but that is typically an internet speed issue, so that's not something that we can help them with. So, okay, so our next section is going to be the targeting program, and that's going to be presented by Wanda Teal from the Department of Health and Human Services. So she will come up here and talk with you now. Good morning, everyone, to those who are in the, excuse me, in the room and the individuals that are um, viewing this um, online. Um, I'm going to go over the targeting program overview and um, some of the vacancy and referral. So the targeting um, program housing goal is to assist individuals to access housing that is affordable, that is permanent and independent, um, integrated in community of choice, and is accessible. The way that we like for you to communicate throughout the targeting program with DHHS and the um, referrals and the referral agencies, it starts out with an applicant. And so if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, the applicant is working with the ARA, which is a um, approved referral agency. And we're gonna go over these acronyms a little bit later on in the PowerPoint presentation. So the applicant starts out with working with the referral agency, and that referral agency fills out a referral packet and they send it over to DHHS. 
DHHS reviews that referral packet, which is a housing assessor, and then if the vacancy is reported by management, then DHHS sends that individual to apply for um, the apartment, the unit that you um, submitted. The applicant is speaking with the property manager, and they're also talking with the referral agency. We like for the property managers to be in communication with DHHS and the applicant and not the referral agency. And we'll talk about it in a few minutes why that's important. Then when that person becomes a tenant, um, it's the same kind of setup. It is the tenant and the referral agency or the tenant and the property manager, and then the property manager and DHHS. The reason why you don't see any straight through arrows between the um, property manager and the referral agency is that we're asking you to allow us to be the liaison allow us to be the person that you talk to regarding that applicant or that tenant. When you go outside those ramifications, it just kind of makes things convoluted. When those referral agencies get involved, we're left out. You don't have anybody as an advocate to help you and the applicant when things are going wrong, either with the application or once that person becomes a tenant. Now, although sometimes during the application process, that referral agency will, might, may accompany that applicant in completing the application. So you may know who the referral agency is working with, the tenant is working with that referral agency. We're still asking you, please do not reach out to the referral agency when there is something going on with a targeted household. Allow DHHS to be your middle person, okay? And it's very important that you do that. The service provider's responsibility, which is the approved referral agency, is to sign a formal agreement with DHHS to participate in our referral program. And so just because a referral agency is working with an um, applicant doesn't mean that they can just make a referral to the program unless they've signed an agreement with us and they've gone through a training. So we just don't let anybody make a referral to the targeting program. They must be partnered with us and they've signed a formal agreement to do so. They are going to refer eligible um, program individuals, making sure that they um, meet the requirements for the targeting key program, and they're going to assist that individual with the application process. So again, that referral agency may call to say, hey, I understand that my applicant has been approved to apply for a unit there. You know, where is your application? Is it online? They may even accompany that person into your office to complete the housing application process. That's fine. They are to assist that individual, but again, once that person leaves the office with that referral, please don't communicate with the referral agency. You are communicating with DHHS or the applicant. They also are to help that individual complete a reasonable accommodation if one is needed during the application process. Um, they provide ongoing support for that person that they made a referral to. So just because a referral agency is approved to make referrals to the targeting program doesn't mean that once that person get into housing, they just drop them off. They are to provide the ongoing supports for that individual while they are living in your targeted unit at your property. And we're gonna talk about later on what happens if um, services is disconnected, if that person is not complying with services, what you guys need to do to reach out to DHHS to let us know so that we could, again, intervene and assist you to get that person back on track with the services that they need. So they are to re-engage, um, coordinate re-engagement. Um, sometimes services don't work out with an agency. Um, sometimes conflict of interest with the individuals that they're working with or the person decide that they just don't wanna work with the agency anymore, now I got housing, I got what I need, I don't need these supports. We realize that with this program, supports with the agency married together most of the time makes a successful tenant. And so if that tenant decides that they no longer want to work with the agency that has referred them, then we are asking that agency to try their best to re-engage with supports. And if they can't, please contact DHHS so that you guys can help that person, the agency can help that person get another referral agency. So again, they're not just to drop them off. Um, if for some reason um, services are disconnected, we're telling that agency, you need to do all you can to re-engage and support. And if all else fails and the person doesn't want to work with you any longer, then put some measures in place so that you can link them up with another agency so they can get the support. Make sure that your job a little bit easier. The tenant's responsibility for the targeting program is a sign up for Section 8. And the reason why we want them to do that is because their rent is a lot cheaper when that person has a Section 8 voucher. So even having a Section 8 voucher, they can stay in your targeted unit and still be considered on the targeting program. They're just getting their rental assistance paid through another entity, which is the local Section 8 office. Um, it makes their rent cheaper because with Section 8, you normally get a utility allowance. With the targeting program, with the key rental assistance, there is no utility allowance. 
So whatever the payment is that that person is responsible for, that's what their, their payment is for. And so we like for them to sign up with Section 8. They're also responsible for paying the utility deposit. We don't pay deposits other than rental assistance. And so that person has to um, pay their own utility deposits when it's time to get utilities cut on in their name. And they're responsible for paying their portion of rent, 30% um, based off of the total household income for that individual. They're also responsible for paying for damages during their tenancy. And so when they're living in your unit, let's say you guys do a unit inspection and you go in and I don't know, um, there is some broken blinds, there are some holes in the walls, um, there are the door is missing off the door frame and all that adds up to like about five hundred dollars but that person can't slay, stay in that unit and just not take care of those damages it's their responsibility however what we're asking management to do is to consider putting them on a payment plan when you do that you're allowing them to pay for those damages while they're living in your unit now let me park it right there for a second to let you know about the payment plan if those damages are in excess of let's say about five hundred dollars well, you know that the individuals that are on a targeting program, they're on a set income. They're getting a disability source of income. So most likely they don't have an extra amount of cash, $500 laying around somewhere. And so we're saying when you put them on a payment plan, the maximum amount that you can charge a targeting household to pay those damages back while they're living in your unit is $50 a month. That's the max. However, if that person says, hey, $50 is a lot coming out of my monthly income, I don't have that. I can pay $20, I can pay 10, or I even can pay $5 a month. Then you have to work with that household according to what they can pay for that payment plan. Make sure you get them to sign the payment plan and you send a copy of that payment plan, payment plan to your housing stabilization coordinator. So one, they can keep a copy of it. And then two, they can notify the um, tenants referral agency to say, hey, you know, Ms. Smith is on a payment plan for these damages. Um, she signed a form to say that she's gonna pay $10 a month. You need to make sure that she has this in her rent. Okay, so make sure you guys know that the maximum you can charge is $50 a month, but that person must take care of those damages while they're living in the unit. And I think Louise may talk about later on special claims, how you get that, or Sandy, one of them, how you get that money back on the back end, should they not take care of the entire um, damage fee while they're living in your unit. Let's say, they get evicted or um, you know they leave or abandon the unit there's some money that you guys can get on the back end should they not satisfy the payment plan that you put them on for those damages okay so I just want to let everyone know that you are allowed to charge for those damages you just have to put them on a payment plan and you can't charge them more than fifty dollars a month and they must comply with the lease you know when everybody comes in and sign the lease they're so excited and you know, you tell them, oh yeah, um, um, you need to come in 120 days prior to your lease expiring and you're gonna have to do this all over again and I'm gonna need your income information and I'm gonna need your banking information and they're all excited and they remember all that. Well, people have a tendency of getting amnesia when it gets close to that time to come in for recertification and you've sent that notice out 120 days and after that first 120 days, you're crickets, you don't hear anything. And then you send a notice out 90 days and it's still crickets, you don't hear anything. Well, we want you to notify DHHS prior to that. When you send that first notice out at the 120 days, if you don't hear anything from your tenant, please notify your housing stabilization coordinator immediately because we don't want your recertifications to be late. We don't want you to wait to the last minute on the 30 days and you send that information out and then something is wrong and you send it to NCHFA for them to review it and Louise kicks it back because there are some corrections that need to be made. Now your research is late. So they're responsible for their annual recertification, okay? So your responsibility to the program is to develop a relationship with DHHS and NCHFA to ensure the partnership is successful. We can't do this program without you guys. We need you and you know you need us so that we can pay the rental assistance um, for the individual and to, and to offer the affordable housing that um, the individuals in our program need. And so it's very important that we foster our relationship and continue building a successful relationship throughout this program. Screen your applicants according to your tenant selection plan. If neither of you, any of you have not um, seen your tenant selection plan, I suggest that you um, locate it and just take a look at it so that you're familiarizing yourself what the TSP is and what your responsibility is to the targeting program regarding what's in the TSP. And then ensure program eligibility and properly document your files. 
again, you want to make sure that your files are documented correctly because if you send it over to Louise at NCHFA and things aren't documented, Sandy talked about earlier, that you can have a non-compliance issue. And you don't want those files kicked back and then ultimately not receiving any payment because there are some corrections that need to be made. Um, continue with management responsibilities to accurately and timely update the vacancy and referral system. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. It's very important that this um, system is updated as um, progress takes place, as referrals are um, coming to you and as you um, report vacancies. Contact DHHS regarding any tenancy issues or concerns. I'm going to give you the names of your housing stabilization coordinators and your housing assessors for your specific properties in your county. So you'll know who to contact at DHHS should you have any issues regarding tenancy issues with your targeting tenants. And then copy DHHS on any correspondences that you send to the tenant. If that person fails an inspection, send that inspection, failed inspection notice to DHHS so that we're aware and that that housing stabilization coordinator is contacting that person's referral agency so that they can get them prepared for that reinspection. If there are any lease violations, any warnings, you make sure you send that information to DHHS because we are keeping um, copies of that in an electronic file that we make on every person that comes that is um, referred to the targeting program. So at the end of the day, again, if Tennessee doesn't work out, and you guys need to apply for risk mitigation or special claims. We have documentation that you've done, you were supposed to do to notify DHHS so that we can get involved to try to help resolve the tenancy. And if for some reason it doesn't, then you'll be able to get money on the back end. And then process requests of the reasonable accommodation in a timely manner according to your tenant selection plan, especially during the um, referral process or when you've reported a vacancy, depending on if it's new construction or if it's turnover. If it's new construction, um, and I don't want to get it too far ahead, but you know, you guys, we had that unit for 90 days. Um, during turnover, when you report a turnover vacancy, we only had that unit for 30 days. And so if someone has requested a reasonable accommodation, you want to go ahead and process that or whoever in your um, management company is responsible for making the decisions to go ahead and render a decision as soon as possible because that unit is held until a decision is rendered. And so if you're on turnover and we get that unit for 30 days and it takes you two to three weeks to make a decision um, regarding the reasonable accommodation and it's getting close to the expiration time of that unit, DHHS still gets to keep that unit until a decision is made. And we don't want to hold your units up. Okay, so we want to make sure that you are rendering a decision in a timely manner. And don't designate um, targeting program units prior to receiving a referral. This is especially important if you are um, reporting more than one unit. If you're reporting three one bedrooms at one time, um, you can't designate the first referral that you get in to go to unit 101 if you have unit 101, 102, and 104. You have to allow that person that comes in to apply for the vacancies that you reported to decide which one of those units that they want to go in um, according to the appropriate bedroom size for that family household size. And don't congregate all of the targeting programs to one building. If your project has multiple buildings, then we want to spread the targeting households out throughout the, the, the um, property. However, if your property only has one building, of course, you're going to put them all in that one building. But we don't want you to um, have them all living in building A or all in building B. We want to make sure you spread it out to, throughout the process um, of the property. So this is a targeted program staff. Um, the program supervisor is Kay Johnson. Um, Kay has been around for the inception of the targeting program, and so she is our go-to person. Um, she is the individual who manages the day-to-day -day operations, so um, any questions that we have regarding targeted housing, um, any situations that come up that we just really don't know all the answers to, then Kay is the individual that we reach out to. And then there are four housing assessors across the state, Monica Frizzell, Frank Bryant, Pamela Chandler, and Monica Jones. And then there are five housing stabilization coordinators across the state, excuse me. Monica Jones, Lamar Johnson, Angela Keith, LaShonda Bryant, and Gillian Hampton. Monica Jones has a dual role, so she's a housing assessor and a stabilization coordinator. And again, I'm going to explain um, the different roles and what these individuals are responsible for in a few minutes. And then I am the program trainer. 
the housing assessor, which is the four individuals that I named first, they manage the referral process. So all of the referral forms that those individuals receive from the referral agencies, they review those forms, make sure that we have all the information that we need, and then they put those individuals on the wait list of the choice that the referral has decided that they want to be on the wait list property for. And so we have a statewide database that we all use, and so that housing assessor puts those individuals in our statewide database on your property or property A or property B, whatever property that that individual decides that they want to be on the wait list for. And then they also are the individuals that provide the um, referrals to the property, and they are the ones who put the letter referral in the BNR system. So the housing assessor is what I like to call the initiator, the initial contact to the targeting program. They're the individuals that you're going to be communicating with when you report a vacancy. So they're going to be the person that you communicate with from the start to the finish of when that person um, actually is referred to your property, when they complete the housing application process, and until they move in. That's the individual that you speak to, the housing assessor. And then the housing stabilization coordinator, the other five individuals that I named, they are a single point of contact to the property manager. They are the liaison between the property manager and the referral agency. So when you have a tenancy issue or a tenancy concern or there's something going on with your targeted tenant, then your communication is with the housing stabilization coordinator. And so they're who I like to call the post um, contact. So the housing assessor is a pre-contact to the program. The housing stabilization coordinator is the post-contact to the program. They're going to protect the program's um, participants' confidentiality. So at no point would they ever tell you who the referral agency is that the individual is working with. And remember I told you, showed you earlier on the screen when we talked about the communication flow and that, you know, we want to make sure that we keep the referral agency and the property management kind of separate. Well, the housing stabilization coordinator they're responsible for making sure that they don't divulge that kind of information to you. They are not to discuss um, who the referral agency is that that person is working with, what type of disability or anything that that person has. Their job is to protect the program participants' responsibility. But any issues that you have with a targeted tenant, your housing stabilization coordinator for your county, your property is the individual that you need to reach out to. And reach out to them via email because, again, we want to make sure that we have a tracking system in case if tenancy doesn't work out, that you guys have done all that you can do to help resolve whatever tenancy issues has been um, reported. And then I am the program trainer. Um, as um, Sandy said earlier um, when she opened up, this is the first time that we've been in person in about two years. I have missed this so much. And so even with the um, limited um, attendance that we have in the room, I am so grateful to be here. <laughs> um, and so hopefully those that are online will be able to expand um, you know, in the future to have more people participate um, in person. But I travel around the state along with N NCHFA. I also train outside of NCHFA and I do just DHHS um, property management trainings um, and so that's my responsibility as well as recruiting and training all the referral agencies so just like you guys are sitting here in this training um, when I do train outside when I'm traveling I also hold these big meetings for the referral agencies or I also do it online which is what um, we're doing today so I'm the pink um, single point of contact also to the management for the new properties so I think Sandy had mentioned earlier about the um, new construction um, calls when they have those calls. Um, I am the person who will reach out to um, the new properties when they're coming online to find out um, what type of units along with the housing assessors that you guys need to put in the vacancy and referral system. When is your property coming online? Um, when are you going to be doing pre-lease up? Um, you know, when are you expecting the CO date? I am the communicator with that um, until um, the referrals are um, in your property and then now become a, a targeted tenant. So I market all of the properties and I advertise them to the referral agencies across the state. So if your company has a property that is opening up out in Asheville, um, I am the person to advertise that property out in Asheville to the referral agencies in that area to say, hey, we got this new property coming on board. We have eight units at this property. Please send your referrals to your housing assessor so that we can get the lease up process going on. And then I'm the point of contact to management um, for the vacancy referral system. So for new management, Management, um, new managers that are on the call um, online, if you're new to the program and you have some questions regarding the vacancy and referral system and you haven't gone through training yet, I'm the individual that you reach out to um, regarding that. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the program policies that we put in place 
um, decrease of the household size. If the household size um, becomes smaller, then please um, make sure you let DHHS know and then we'll, we will determine if the household would need to move to an appropriate size unit or provide a waiver for them to stay in the larger size unit that they're in. Um, the death of the head of household, if the head of household passes away and there are remaining household members left, um, DHHS will um, provide assistance to those remaining households between um, for 30 to 90 days, depending on um, if we're trying to get those additional household members to qualify for that targeted unit to stay there. So again, make sure you reach out to DHHS. And then unoccupied unit, um, if a um, targeted household, the head of household um, goes into a facility of some sort and they are um, out of the unit for um, 90 days, um, the targeting program will terminate the key renewal assistance um, because we can't pay for the key renewal assistance if the head of household um, is not in um, that unit. Um, and if there are no plans for them to return um, to the unit, then we will terminate the rental assistance after the 90 days. And then again, that is communication between your um, housing stabilization coordinator regarding that um, head of household. This slide here needs to be omitted. We just didn't have time to omit it, so guys, you can disregard this slide. Here are some commonly used, ac commonly used acronyms that you may see in communication and email communication with the DHHS staff members. Earlier on the slide, when it talked about the communication flow, you saw the acronyms, the ARA, that stands for an approved referral agencies. Those are the individuals that have partnered with us to submit referrals for the targeting program. Um, if you're ever communicating with me when there's a new lease up and I'm constantly emailing you saying, hey, have you heard anything about about CO, can you tell me when it's expected CO? Have you received CO yet? That stands for the Certificate of Occupancy. And I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, I'm gonna skip around because you guys can read these on your own and figure them out. What I do wanna go ahead and cover is HA, if you see that in the email, that stands for your Housing Assessor. Um, the HSC, um, which is your Housing Stabilization Coordinator. All of you should hopefully know what a LOR is. That is the letter of referral. That is um, what I call the money ticket of what we send over to NCHFA so they can pay the rental assistance, um, rental subsidy for that targeted household that is living in your targeted unit. Um, RCRS, everybody should know what RCRS is. That's the Rental Compliance Supporting System. Um, SSDI stands for the Social Security Disability Income. SSI is a Supplemental Security Income. If you ever hear any communication between NCHFA or the DHHS staff talking about the LMEMCO, that stands for the Local Management Entity or the Managed Care Organization. And VNR, you'll see that a lot. We don't spell out vacancy and referral. We'll do VNR. That stands for the vacancy and referral system. So we're going to go with vacancy and referral. Yes. Okay. Can you answer? Yes, I can. You will repeat the question when I okay. Okay, so the question was what if a targeted res resident refuses agency representation. representation? Then you need to reach out to your housing stabilization coordinator, and I believe there are, are the maps in the slide point presentation, oh, Louise. Okay. Okay. So in the back of your book, I think it's the last page or last two pages of the book, there is um, a breakdown of what counties each housing stabilization coordinator is responsible for and their name and their email address. If you would email your housing stabilization coordinator for your county for which your property is located and let them know that um, the targeted tenant doesn't have any services or have refused services. Um, then the housing stabilization coordinator will reach out to the targeting household and get the ball running and rolling as to find out what's going on with that household. And so again, please make sure you are communicating with your housing stabilization coordinator. That is once that person becomes a targeted tenant, they are living in your unit, whether they've been a targeted tenant in your property for 10 years or they just moved in yesterday. 
You need to communicate with your housing stabilization coordinator if there are any tenancy issues or concerns. Um, one of the examples I like to give for concern is, let's say you had a targeted household who's been paying their rent on time. They've been living in that property for four years and they've been paying their rent on time. They've never had any questions, any issues. Now all of a sudden they're late this month and they call you and say, hey, I'm gonna be a little late paying my rent this month. I'm not gonna pay it until the 10th. And you know this is a good tenant. They've always paid on time. And you say, okay, I'll give you to the 10th. Please make sure you notify your housing stabilization coordinator that you have discussed giving this person some time to pay their rent. Because then the next month comes up and they're like, hey, I'm a little late again, you know, paying my rent. I won't be able to pay until the 15th. And you're like, oh, no problem. You've been such a great tenant. You can wait and pay it on the 15th. Again, reach out to your housing stabilization coordinator and let them know because now the third month comes and they're late again. Well, clearly there's a crisis. There's an issue. There's something going on that you may not be privy of. And so you want the housing stabilization coordinator to be aware in case that they need to reach out to the referral agency. And if that person doesn't have a referral agency to work with that household on getting them linked up with another agency. Because at the end of the day, without agency representation, that targeted household most likely is going to lose their unit. Okay. Any other questions so far, Louise? It's okay. Okay. Okay, all right. So the vacancy and referral system, um, it starts with your management company give you access to RCRS. Um, and so in order to have access to BNR, you have to have access to RCRS. And the way that you know that you have access is that at the bottom, when you log on to RCRS and you log on to your property, there is a little box that says report vacancies. If that box is checked, then that means you as a site manager or the property manager has access to the vacancy and referral system. If that box is not checked, then you don't have access to reporting vacancies and most likely your vacancies are being reported by someone at your corporate office, maybe your compliance um, um, director or person in compliance. So when you're ready to report a vacancy, management must enter a vacancy in order to receive a referral. All your units must be reported, including market units. And so I wanna park it right here and just explain, if you have not been reporting all your vacancies, let's say you have market units like, oh, well this isn't a part of the targeting program, this isn't a targeting unit because this is a market unit and we can't rent this market unit to a targeting household, so I'm just gonna go ahead and just um, fill this vacancy off of my wait list, that's a no-no. So from here on out, every single unit at your property gets reported in the vacancy and referral system. Because I'm gonna show you later on what happens if that unit needs to come back to you if it's a unit that we can't fill with a targeted household. So if you have not been reporting, those that are listening online, if you have not been reporting your vacancies, every single vacancy at this point, every vacancy that comes to your property, comes on your property, needs to be reported in the vacancy or referral system from here on out. And then the housing assessor between communicating with you will work with you with giving that unit back to you if it's not needed. And we're gonna talk about it in a few minutes. Enter the vacancy as soon as you're notified. And so let's say you have a household that is giving you a notice to vacate and they're gonna move out on the, I don't know, um, what's today, the 9th? They're gonna move out on March 9th and they give you the notice today. Go ahead and put that unit in because during turnover, because this is turnover now, we only have these units for, nine, for 30 days and we wanna make sure that we find a referral to send over immediately so that you guys can go ahead and start getting that unit um, um, filled and, and start go ahead and making you know, the residual rent off of the unit that you, you, know, that you need. Um, if for some reason during that process, you report that notice to vacate today and that person comes back two weeks later and decide that they want to stay in that unit, well, management can make that decision. You guys can say, hey, well, yeah, we're gonna let this household stay in the unit. Please notify DHHS. Contact your housing assessor to let them know that this unit is no longer available, even if there is a referral in process. You are not to offer the next vacancy to that referral. You are to contact DHHS to let them know that this unit is no longer available and allow DHHS to reach out to that referrals referral agency to let them know what the next steps are. So you need to go ahead and make sure that you are communicating with your housing assessor doing the reported vacancy process. For um, new properties, you're gonna reach out to uh, me, the program trainer, to determine what type of units you need to put in. As Sandy said earlier, let's say your property is responsible 
you have 85 units and you're responsible for giving us 10% um, of those units, then um, you will go ahead and just give us, um, is it nine with the 85? You will put, you would give us the nine units. And at that point, I'm communicating with you and your housing assessors communicating with you, letting you know what type of units we need set aside out of your portfolio so that you're not renting up our units. Because again, we get the units first. Um, so don't put in all those 85 units because we don't need all those 85 units. We're going to tell you the type of units we need specifically for the referrals that we're sending over um, to you based on the, head, um, the size of the household. Um, and all vacancies must be entered at turnover. As I said earlier, whether you've met your targeted unit agreement or not, or whether it's a market unit, again, I want to keep stressing that every single unit must be reported in the BNR system, even if you met your targeted unit agreement. And we're going to talk about how to get that unit back if you met your targeted unit agreement in a few minutes. And then the, all the ISHP properties, you're going to be communicating with um, the LMEMCO um, as it relates to the vacancies and actually Kay Johnson, if you guys want to make a note, is the individual that you would communicate if you are on the line or you are in the room and you have an ISHP property, then Kay Johnson is responsible for the lease up for those properties. And Kay's information is listed in the back of the book as well. Um, for rehab units, um, when you are having, when you have a rehab project, then the vacancy reporting should start uh, for the BNR system once all in-place tenants have been permanently housed in the rehab unit, um, whether they return to their original unit or they choose a new rehab unit. Um, and any newly rehab units will be available to rent to someone off the wait list. That's when you need to go ahead and report um, your vacancies if you're a rehab property. Um, you want to make sure that you put all the existing tenants back into either their new unit or their rehab unit or new unit, and then whatever's left over, then you report those units to um, DHHS so that we can fill them with our targeted households. And if we don't need those units, we'll give them back. And so when you go into the system, the vacancy and referral system, um, one thing I wanted to explain really quick, guys, before I talk about the vacancy and referral system, um, and I'm not really sure, we haven't done this in a while, so I'm not really sure where this is in the PowerPoint. The vacancy and referral system belongs to DHHS. That's our system. We developed the system. However, um, NCHFA's, well, we designed the system. NCHFA's um, team developed the system, and we house it inside of RCRS. And the reason why we did this is because we didn't want you guys to have to log on to do two different systems every single day. You already have one program that you have to log on into, I'm sure, for your management company, and then logging into RCRS to take care of the compliance stuff. We didn't want you to have to log into something else to report the vacancies. And so a long time ago, we used to have these forms that you filled out when there's a vacancy, and then you would fax that form over to your housing um, stabilization coordinator. We had to give a, um, do away with those forms because managers were not reporting vacancies properly. They were giving us what they wanted to give us instead of giving us all the vacancies to allow DHHS to choose what we need for our um, population that we serve. And so we designed this system and we housed it into RCRS. They are two separate systems. They do not talk to each other. So vacancy and referral and RCRS do not talk to each other, although they are housed together. Okay, so I just want to make sure that I made that, that note. So when you go into the property and you want to report a vacancy, uh, once you log on, you're going to go up and you're going to see there are several different tabs. And at the top, you're going to choose Add Vacancy. And this is where you're going to add the unit that you are reporting in the vacancy and referral system. And this is what the screen looks like when you're going to go add a unit. You're going to put the name of the property. The name of the property and the address and the management information is highlighted in blue, but that should already be there. Um, to the left of the screen, you're going to, um, right of the screen, you're going to make sure that you put the date available for occupancy. Now, if you report a vacancy today and you put that it's available today, then that's letting DHHS know that you did not report that vacancy accurately because if it's, to, if it's ready for moving today, you should have reported it when you first got the notice. Unless someone has skipped and they left that unit immaculate, which I don't know if that's done too often. <laughs> Unless they've left that unit immaculate, if you're telling us that that person is ready, a referral would be ready to move in today, you have not reported that unit properly. So again, we want to make sure that you guys understand to report your vacancy 
as soon as it happens. Um, make sure that you put the bedroom count, whether it's smoking on the unit or not. Um, where it says subsidy, um, that used to say availability, and I'm, I'm seeing that it's changed the subsidy. This part here is missed a lot. Louise, do we still have the little um, pointer? Yeah, okay. I don't know. Yeah, and I don't know if um, the individuals online can see this, but where it says subsidy here, a lot of times, guys, this is a huge mistake made by management who is reporting vacancies because they leave this blank. If you are at a key property, your subsidy should be key 100% of the time, every time. It should say key. That should never be left blank. A lot of times, either management, they're going too fast, they're moving along too fast. Sometimes management even doesn't understand what that means. So that's what that means. Um, I think it's changed. It used to say accessibility or account affordability. Well, now it says subsidy. So if you're at a key funded property, it should say key every single time. If you're at a PBRA property, does it say PBRA, um, Louise? It gives you those different options. So make sure you are choosing the funding that is at your property. And the reason why this is important is because the housing assessor that's working with you has to know what type of subsidy is at your particular property. So make sure you are filling that in um, correctly. Um, and then the unit number or the description um, for turnover units, you can put the unit number there. Um, if it's a townhouse, we do have some management companies that have townhouses that they are managing. At that point, um, you can put townhouse in the description so that the housing assessor would know that this unit has stairs to it. And so it's a townhouse where that person has to go inside the unit and go up the stairs to access the, you know, the rest of the, the living quarters of the home. The unit accessibility, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes because a lot of times this is missed as well. And so we want to make sure that you are completing that um, correctly. And at the bottom where it says reason for vacancy, targeted unit moving, a targeted tenant moving out, a lot of times this is a mistake as well. Managers make, make um, common mistakes here as well. You would only need to complete this if it is a targeting household moving out of the unit. If it's not a targeted household, if it's just a regular person that's moving out of um, the unit, um, then you don't need to complete that. But if it's a targeted unit tenant moving out, then make sure you complete that. It's gonna be a drop down arrow. It's gonna, if you click yes, it's gonna ask you the name of the targeted tenant and the reason that they're moving out. If it's just a regular tenant, you still need to report the vacancy, but you would just put no. Do you know your units? Remember I said earlier, right here, a lot of managers get this here um, kind of confused because they don't understand what is a rolling shower, um, the accessibility, the description of those units. And so we wanna make sure you understand what the description of the units are. Um, what makes a unit accessible? If that unit has a rolling shower, it's considered a fully accessible unit. And so if you are choosing um, fully accessible, you're telling DHHS that that unit has a roll-in shower. If you are choosing handicapped for that unit, you're telling DHHS that that unit has wider doors and grab bars. Um, if you choose both of these, and that's telling DHHS that that unit has a roll-in shower and it has wider doors and grab bars. That's extremely important, guys, because sometimes if you're reporting a unit and you're letting us know that the unit has these features and we're looking for a household that would benefit from using that particular unit, like maybe someone that's in a wheelchair or someone that has um, issues with um, maybe having to hold on to the wall or something, hold on to grab bars in the shower. So make sure that you are um, choosing the right description for your unit. If the unit has um, assertive technology, um, then of course it's considered a visible um, audio accessible unit. And if the unit has more than one floor, interior stairs, that's for a townhouse. So remember I said earlier in the unit description, that's where you will put that that's a townhouse, letting the housing assessor know that the interior part of this household, that person is gonna have to go up some stairs to occupy some of the other um, um, features of the home. Um, exterior stairs, are there stairs to access the unit? Um, this can be one or multiple. We, how I like to explain this is that, let's say you have a unit that's on a ground floor and you're considered on a ground floor unit, but there's a small step up that that person has to get on to get to the door to get in the unit. 
that is going to be considered an exterior stair. And the reason why that is so important is because on the next screen, again, we are looking for households to fill the unit based off of what you described that unit um, is. And so if you're telling us that this is a ground floor unit, but you don't let us know that that's that small step up that is considered an exterior stair, the housing assessor may send someone over in a wheelchair. Well, you know, if you send someone over in a wheelchair, they're not going to be able to get in that unit. They're going to have to do a poppy really to get in that unit. And that's unsafe. So just make sure that you are putting the right descriptions for your units. And if you ever get confused, if you hover over the asterisk under each one of these, it's going to explain to you um, the explanation and description of what each of those mean. Okay? So the housing assessor, once you report your vacancy, again, now we're reporting that vacancy in the VNR system, they have up to five days to acknowledge your vacancy. And then during that time, they are looking for a referral to fill that vacancy that you've reported. They're going to, at that point, when they find someone to fit that specific unit that you've reported, they're going to submit a letter of referral and any other applicable waivers, if there needs to be a unit size waiver or any type of waivers that needs to go with that household, they're going to put it in the system at that time. And then they have... 30 days to fill that vacancy um, that you've reported. So this is what the screen looks like for the housing assessors. So our screen looks familiar to you guys. The one that I just showed you a few minutes ago, the add vacancy, that was the property manager screen. This is a screen for the housing assessors of what the screen looks like. And so they're going to put in the referral's name um, at the top. Um, they're going to put in all the information. They're going to submit the letter of referral here. Um, you guys don't have this information. It is just priority. You would never know we have four priority groups. We can't disclose that information to you guys. Against, um, it is against um, HIPAA law for us to do that. And they will never let you know who the referral agency is. But the subsidy should match your subsidy. And so if you have key rental assistance and it says key when you report your vacancy, then the housing assessor is going to choose key on our side because they're saying this is a subsidy that matches what management has um, reported. Um, they're also going to put in the household size. So if you reported at one bedroom and we're sending two people over, they're going to tell you that two people are coming over to apply for that unit. If three people show up to apply for that unit, and you know that in the system, the housing assessor only said only two people are coming, you need to stop, contact your housing assessor, say, hey, there's an extra person here applying for this unit. And in the system, you said that they're only supposed to be two. Because sometimes people try to move in on other folks um, that are, you know, um, getting a benefit. So let's say your targeted unit agreement has been met. You're reporting a vacancy. You were in training and you said, oh, I heard Wanda Teal say, I have to report every single vacancy whether it's a market rent um, or not, um, whether my targeted unit agreement has been met or not. I know that I'm only supposed to have five, pe five units and I have all five, I'm gonna keep this vacancy for myself. You still must report that vacancy. And so once you report the vacancy, you can request to have that vacancy released back to you. And then the housing assessor will release the unit. It says five days, um, but Louise, we're gonna change that. It's actually two days. So if you guys put two days, the housing assessor has two days to release that vacancy back to you. And so what will happen is once you report a vacancy, everything that you do from this point on is going to be done under actions. Everything that you do from this point on is under actions. And so you're going to say, hey, I met my targeted unit agreement. Well, the housing assessor is going to look at your property to make sure that you've met your targeted unit agreement. And the way that they can tell is if you look over there in the left-hand side of the screen, um, it says quite required DHHS targeted units is six. That's how many the property is required to give us. The reported targeted units that has been filled is six. So that lets the housing assessors know that you have met your targeted unit agreement and that you are re requesting release of this vacancy. And within two days, they should release that vacancy back to you. And so this is a screen that the housing assessor sees and they are gonna either release that vacancy back to you because you've met that number, but if the number is di different, they're gonna deny release of the request. Now, the number could be accurate on your end. Like you really may have all of your six targeted unit um, tenants in your unit, but it's only showing five. Well, that could be a subsidy issue. Maybe there was, you didn't choose the right subsidy. Maybe someone received a Section 8 voucher and you didn't tag it right in the system for the vacancy referral system to populate that person over as one of your targeted households. 
So if you know that those six is accurate on your end, but the housing assessor is saying, no, you guys are only showing five, then at that point you guys may have to, you and the housing assessor may have to do some comparison to let them know how many people you have in and who you have in your targeted units and then who we have listed as living in your targeted units so that that can be resolved and then they'll show you how to resolve it. So pending contact. Um, so you've reported a vacancy, it's a real vacancy, you know, it's not one that you need back, you really need to fill it with a targeted household, it's one of your targeted units you need filled. Well, the referral should contact you within five days once that housing assessor places a letter of referral in the system and you get that letter of referral, then that household should be contacting you within five business days, so that, and it's business days, okay, not calendar days, it's five business days so that they can make a housing application with you for that vacancy that you reported. Um, and the DHHS still has access to the unit if the referral doesn't respond. So even though that referral has five days, let's say they have not responded, let's say they were a no-show. They didn't call you, they didn't show up at the property, crickets, you haven't heard anything. On the sixth day, you need to update the vacancy referral system so that the housing assessor will know I need to get in contact with this household that I referred to this property because management is saying that they never contacted them, they never made a housing application appointment, there is nothing. We still hold that unit because now the housing assessor needs to find out what's going on. They need to know if that person is still interested, if the person um, isn't interested. And what happens is you go back to vacancy and referral, you go to actions, as I said earlier, because everything is done under actions, and then you're gonna choose request contact status follow-up. And that is letting the housing assessor know, hey, I need to reach out to this referral to find out what's going on. So they're gonna contact the referral agency. Um, at that point, the referral agency is reaching out to the referral to say, hey, you were supposed to go and apply for that unit five days ago. Management is saying you haven't showed up. Are you still interested in that unit? Um, do you still want to go? It could be anything, guys. Maybe they didn't have right transportation. Um, they could have forgotten or whatever. So we want to make sure that we're giving that um, referral agency time to um, reach back out to the housing, um, to the referral um, to find out if they're still interested. And if they're interested, then they're going to tell the um, housing assessor, yes, they have some issues, they're going to come in, um, please let management know. At that point, the um, housing assessor will send you an email um, and they're going to revive, tell you to revive, they're going to revive the, the um, no-show in the system or they're going to tell you to close it out. They're going to say, yep, the person is still coming or no, they're not interested at that point. And then at that point, the housing assessor will say, you can go ahead and close that um, referral out, they're no longer um, interested. And they'll hold that unit as long as it's not closer to 30 days to find um, a new referral. Now what I can tell you is that um, the housing assessors have been releasing those units, they're not holding them, looking for another referral, because this is a process. Sometimes you're 15 days into the month when that person didn't, you know, you give them five days, they have to show up, and then it takes a few days for the referral agency to reach out to them to find out if they're interested, and now the referral, because we're all busy, and now the referral agency is taking two days to contact DHHS to say, no, the person isn't interested, so you're looking, you're 10 days into the month now. A lot of the times the housing assessor won't send you another referral, they're going to release that unit back to you so that you can rent it off of your wait list because the process just takes so time, so much time. It just depends on um, the high volume of, of your particular property um, if um, we're needing to go ahead and utilize your property. So let's say that the person did show up. They came in when they were supposed to come in. They um, are doing the um, application. They're ready to apply. You're going to go ahead and you're going to help. They're going to complete the application with you. You're going to update the vacancy and referral system, um, system uh, with documentation. Um, let's say the process application, there are no fees. Make sure that you understand that you are not um, charging any of the household members for the targeting households an application fee. They pay none. Zero at all. I don't care what you charge at your property. Um, applicants for the targeting program do not pay um, an application fee. And make sure that you are following, again, your tenant selection plan. If you have not reviewed it, I strongly recommend that you get a copy of it and you're looking at um, to see to make sure that you are following the process on your tenant selection plan. So the person came in, they, bring, they brought all their documentation in, and they're ready to apply, but they're missing something. 
they're missing some information. Let's say they're missing, I don't know, two of the um, banking statements that you guys need of the six months worth or maybe one of their pay stubs um, and it's preventing you from processing the application. You're going to update the vacancy and referral system with comments if there's missing information um, and then follow up with an email with the housing assessor as well. There's a section at the bottom I'm going to show you where you update and put the comments but I strongly strongly recommend that you also send the housing assessor an email again we're all busy they have multiple multiple counties and properties that they're responsible for and so they may not get to your specific property um, within you know the time frame that you need it for them to um, reply back to you regarding the missing information that you need for that targeted applicant um, and so when you go to the um, in the vacancy referral system under your applicant um, there is a section at the bottom of the um, referral page and you can put here um, that you're missing income verification and just add that. Again, the housing assessors, they're looking at the vacancy and referral system every day just like you guys are, but again, we all get busy and so you want to make sure that you follow up with um, an email. Guys, what I like to tell um, managers during the VNR system when you're reporting, it's like a ping pong game. If you report a unit, the housing assessor hits back with the, a referral that they send in. And then you hit back with that person has come in and applied and now you're waiting um, to get um, results on their um, application process. So if you report a vacancy, please make sure you are looking at the vacancy and referral system every day. I know you're busy. You guys have other managerial duties that you're responsible for, but if you report a vacancy, you should be looking at the vacancy and referral system on a daily basis because the housing assessors should be looking at the vacancy and referral system on a daily basis if a referral has been sent to apply for that vacancy that you reported. So this is an example of what the housing assessor sees when you have updated the system, say there's missing information. Um, or the, the application is pending application results or if it's been denied. This is just um, the comment section of what the housing assessor sees on our end when you update the system like you should. Now let's say nothing was missing. They bought all the information in and you're ready. They filled out the application. They've been approved and now you're ready to go ahead and schedule a moving date. Again, I said earlier, it's a ping pong game. Um, you hit, DHHS hit. You hit, DHHS hit. So now it's time to approve that individual for that unit that you reported. You're going to go into the system and you're going to arrange a move-in date. And so again, everything is done under actions once you report a vacancy. And so you are to approve this application um, if um, that person has been approved or if the application has been denied. Again, all of that is done under um, actions. There's a denial button and there's a withdraw button. So they, you updated it. You've um, now going to go ahead and reserve that particular vacancy that you have reported for that individual in the vacancy or referral system and you're going to enter an expected moving date. And again, I got to keep repeating it. Everything is done under actions. So once you go in and approve that person, you go back into actions and then now you're going to reserve the vacancy for that individual for the unit that you've reported. And so you're going to hit reserve vacancy up here at the top and you're going to choose the unit. If you've only reported one vacancy, then of course you only have one unit to choose. If you've reported multiple vacancies, make sure that you are choosing the correct unit that that person is going to be moving into. Let's say they change their mind after you reserve that unit. Oh, I reserved a unit and now this person is going to be moving into that unit soon. And they change their mind or they want to choose another unit because you reported more than one unit. Um, or they decide, I don't want to live here at all. I just want to withdraw the application. Then you can do that as long as you don't move the person into the vacancy referral system. And again, you're going to go to actions and you're going to undo vacancy reservation. Please do not hit confirm move in. Because once you hit confirm move in, you have moved that person in the VNR system and then you're going to have to call Sandy Harris <laughs> and Sandy's going to have to do her work, her magic on getting that person um, unreserved and unmoved out of that unit that you moved them in. But you can undo a vacancy once you reserve um, a unit. Don't panic if the person says, oh, I don't want to move in that unit or I don't want to live in this property at all. Or you get notification from us that the person decided to change their mind. You can undo the vacancy. And if you have any questions regarding that while you're talking to your housing um, assessor, they can walk you through that process on how to undo the vacancy if you forget. 
So it's the move-in day. Everything is working well. You guys are updating the vacancy and referral system in a timely manner like you're supposed to. And now you want to go ahead and get that person moved into their unit. You're going to make sure that the person signs all their lease documentation. Um, and then management moves, confirms the move-in date in the vacancy and referral system. And a compliance tip at the bottom is move-in must be reported in RCRS as well. Move in the vacancy and referral system first and confirm it and then move them into RCRS. If you move them into RCRS first, a lot of times managers forget to go back and move them into VNR and then you're wondering why you're not getting paid. Well, you're not getting paid because they're not showing up as a tenant on the vacancy referral side of the system. So if you do everything in VNR first, remember earlier I said, guys, these are two separate systems. They do not talk to each other at all, although they're housed together they don't talk to each other. If you do everything in VNR first, and then you go back and do everything in RCRS, you'll avoid some non-compliance issues. So you're gonna to go to actions, as I said earlier, and this is a um, screenshot if there were multiple units that have been reported in VNR. And so you wanna make sure you're choosing the right unit for that individual, um, and then you're gonna put in the move-in date. This is not the expected move-in date, this is actually the move-in date because you are now moving them into the vacancy and referral system. So some things to remember, the letter of referral shows the bedroom size um, on the bottom, so it's letting you know the unit size that you have reported in the system. It's gonna also um, indicate that on the letter of referral coming from the housing assessor um, and how many individuals we've sending over for that particular bedroom size that you have reported in the system. If you reported a one bedroom and we're sending two people and the letter of referral said two people and three people show up to, to apply for that unit, please stop again and call your housing assessor because something is wrong with, with that um, system, uh, with that process. And then update the BNR as activity take place. Don't wait until the last minute. I said a few minutes ago, those systems do not talk to each other. If you do everything in RCRS first, you're gonna forget to go back and do vacancy and referral. And I can tell you that in the past, there have been issues with management forgetting to do that. And then there is outstanding rental assistance that they are looking for that they won't get because they waited too long to update the system and have passed the date. So you wanna make sure that you're doing everything step by step in a timely manner. And then of course, um, make sure that you contact the housing assessor or um, North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, contact um, Louise. Um, if there's some issues going on with the lease before you sign the lease, because once you sign it, that's it. So if the person is supposed to be paying $200 for rent and somehow miraculously your lease says $50 for rent and they sign that $50, you're gonna eat the 100 and 50 or however much is left over. So make sure you stop, make sure that you are looking at the lease that everything lines up like it's supposed to. And if there are some questions, prior to you actually signing it with the person, stop, contact your housing assessor or contact NCHFA so they can help answer those questions for you. Yep, we're gonna take a break for 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Um, a couple of things, we wanna answer a question that was asked before the break. Um, the question was, um, I have a question for Wanda Teal. When there is any type of action that occurs in the vacancy and referral section of RCRS, does the property receive an email notification to let them know there is a message slash update they need to log into to view the system? I'm not Wanda Teal, but I can answer that question and the answer is no. You do not get a notification that something has been put in vacancy and referral like you do when something gets put in RCRS. So it's important that you log in to vacancy and referral every day because what will happen any comments or things that are added will be at the top on your home screen but you do need to sign in every day so you do not get because you don't get notification that they've added something yes that is on our wish list of things if the um, IT department ever comes back around that is something that we've asked them to do because again if that's not a system that you're in all the time you don't often remember to go in there so again just check the system every day but we do have that on the wish list of things to cover if they can enhance our system other thing again the people here that are in the room you are very quiet very studious but if you have questions please don't hesitate to ask so all right, so the next section we're gonna talk about are denied applications and the appeal process. Oh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. When there's a back and forth, like the two condoms of um, application 
Okay, her question is, if um, I'm assuming because she referred to 90 days, the property is in the initial lease up, so DHHS has 90 days access to the unit. They've had somebody apply, or they got a referral, they didn't show up within the five days, then they did show up and they gave an application, and then they didn't have everything. So we're working in towards the 90 days. So I'm assuming your question is, from the time you get the referral, that starts the clock on the 90 days. So yes, the, whenever DHHS puts the referral in the system, you've got to give them access to the unit for 90 days. And that's an initial lease up. At um, turnover, now of course, it's only 30 days. Yes, yeah, so in essence, her question is, of course, Wanda talked about if they're missing verifications and you add that information in vacancy and referral, is all of that back and forth considered part of the 90 days or just the mere fact that they're working on it, the clock stops? No, the clock, clock starts when the referral is submitted in the system and then it goes through either the 30 or 90 days. Now, having said that, if you get a referral from DHHS on the 27th day, you don't get to say you got three days give me your information if not i want my unit back so again you know there are certain things that you have to work with them but that does that is how the clock starts that's why it's very important that you put your information in um vacancy and referral timely that way they know so they don't run out of time inevitably and not realize it because you haven't provided them information so right now we're going to talk about denied applications and appeals of course we never like to deny an application but there are times that you must deny an application the most important thing to do is if you deny an application, make absolutely certain that you update vacancy and referral. If you deny them today, update vacancy and referral today. Upload the denial letter in vacancy and referral. When you upload the denial letter in vacancy and referral, that starts the eight day appeal period. If you deny them today and you do not upload the letter until the 25th of February, their eight days starts the 25th of February. So again, the proof is in the pudding. Make sure you upload it because it does say in the system what date and time that it's uploaded. All right. So once you upload the denial letter, that doesn't mean you can automatically take somebody off your wait list. You still have to continue to hold that unit for DHHS um, to work with the applicant to see if they want to appeal. Now, if DHHS gives you the referral, 20 days in, the person applies, you get all of your information, and you deny it on the 27th day, they still get eight days. So you will actually hold that unit longer than 30 days. So they still get the appeal period, even if they didn't apply until later into the um, time that you've had the unit. So in vacancy and referral, if the actions tab is on your side, that means the system's waiting for you to do something. And in this case, because the person has submitted an application, the actions tab is on management side. So vacancy and referrals waiting for you to tell them either they're approved, they're denied, or they've changed their mind. So in this case, you're going to deny the application by selecting deny application. And then you're gonna have some options here as to why you can deny them. Are you denying them for credit? Are you denying them for criminal? And are you denying them for landlord reference? And then you need to put in there the date that they're denied and then you're going to upload the denial letter and the date on that letter should be the same date that you've denied them and that you're uploading it. We will talk um, a little bit more about these different sections and the denials, but you need to make sure that you answer these questions. We talked about that the date the denial letter is uploaded is the date that the clock starts. So make sure that you upload it then because if you don't, you're gonna have to hold that unit forever. When the application is denied, DHHS, of course, they're in the system on a regular basis, so they're going to know that you put something in there. They're going to reach out to the referral agency, let them know that the person that they referred was denied, and then the agency is going to work with the applicant to determine if they want to appeal. All right, and then they, the housing assessor is going to say they're going to appeal, or no, they're not going to appeal. Just because the housing assessor says they're going to appeal, that doesn't suffice as their actual appeal. That's just basically kind of giving you a heads up. You should be expecting something, all right? They still have to make their request to you 
about their appeal. I'm sure many of you have a form that if somebody wants to appeal or make a reasonable accommodation request, you have a specific form that you want them to fill out to ensure that you get all the information you need to do a proper review. It is fine that you have that form, but if that applicant decides to write that appeal on a blank sheet of paper or on a napkin from Hardy's, you have to accept it. You cannot require that they use your form. You can require that they provide you all the information that you need, but you cannot require the method in which you get it. Nine times out of 10, the appeal is being um, prepared in conjunction with the service provider and the applicant, and it will come on just regular sheets of paper or whatever. Um, I don't know that I've ever had somebody come in and bring it on a napkin, but if that's why they choose to get it to you, you have to accept that. As long as they give you the information, you have to accept it that way. If they choose not to appeal, the housing assessor is going to close the referral. And you know they're done. They may send you another one or they may release the unit. That's how you know if there's going to be an appeal. Um, if the applicant chooses to appeal and they've given you their information, they have eight business days to appeal. So if you deny them today, they have eight business days from today to get you the information that you need to, let, to say, all right, I'm appealing and this is the reason why. Once you receive the appeal, you're going to revive the application in vacancy and referral. I will tell you that there was some system enhancements made recently because in the past, only management could upload the appeals. The applicant had to go directly to management. A lot of times, DHHS didn't even know the person had appealed or whatever the circumstances were. Or there were questions about the quality of the appeal or that sort of thing. So now, DHHS has the option to upload the appeal. So you may get an appeal that's uploaded from DHHS and they'll call you and say, I uploaded the appeal and never actually come from the applicant. So again, DHHS can upload those, but if they are, most of the time they're sending you an email saying, I've just uploaded the appeal or they're picking up the phone and calling you. In the past, it was just the property that could do that, but now DHHS can do that as well. And from what I understand, it's working better as far as the flow of information when DHHS does it, because they get the information, then they can call you and let you know it's there and it processes just smoother. You must hold that unit while you're reviewing the appeal. In your tenant selection policy that we have approved, you have put in your tenant selection policy what your review process is when reasonable accommodation requests are made. Nine times out of 10, the person that made the initial denial is not the person that's reviewing the reasonable accommodation request, okay? Nine times out of 10, it's not even the site manager. The site manager may get it in vacancy and referral, but then they have to send the information to someone else to say, hey, I need you to review this and let me know if we can approve it or if we'll go through with the denial. Make sure that you're letting whoever that person is know timely because if you don't and it sits there for two weeks, you're holding that unit for another two weeks. So you're not getting any rent on that unit. So make sure that there's timely flow of information between the people that are doing these reviews. The other thing is, is if your tenant selection policy says, we will review these and have a decision with 20, within 24 hours, so you need to make sure that you're doing it within 24 hours. I don't know very many reasonable accommodation requests that can be done within 24 hours, but if that's what your tenant selection plan says, then make sure that you're following that. All right, as far as credit, you know, that's a question that you have to answer in vacancy and referral. Were they denied based on credit? For those working in the targeting program, you should be familiar with your tenant selection policy. And your tenant selection policy states clearly that you cannot deny a member of the targeting program or a member of any other program that you have access to risk mitigations strictly for credit. All right, now, so what that means in layman's terms. When I was in property management, if you left Owen me, you're gonna let, leave Owen the next one. So that was an automatic denial, all right? Well, in normal property management, somebody leaves, you know, they owe you money, you'll get there to keep their deposit, but any money over and above that, you may not ever see that. With the targeting program and other programs out there, you have access to what's called risk mitigations. So you can get money for, or special claims, terms are the same, 
either risk mitigations or special claims, it's all the same, which we'll talk more about this afternoon, but you have the ability to collect money for unpaid rent, tenant damages, and for vacancy loss. You wouldn't normally have that in your, for just you know, somebody coming in off the street that's not part of these programs. That's why you cannot deny them for credit because you have the ability to file for special claims. So the only time that you should answer, did they get denied for credit as yes, should be as if it relates to utilities and the ability to get utilities connected in their unit. So I decide that I wanna to move to Cypress Glen, maybe it's in Cary, all right? Utility provider in Cary, maybe it's the town of Cary or maybe Duke Energy, all right? You run my credit. I owe Dominion Energy out of Virginia for utilities. Typically, property management companies do not allow you to move in their unit if you owe utilities or a previous landlord, okay? Well, the fact that I owe Dominion Energy has no bearing on whether or not I can get utilities at your property because Dominion Energy doesn't provide you utilities. Duke Energy doesn't care that I owe Dominion and they don't care, the town of Cary doesn't care. So as long as I can get utilities established by the um, utility provider at your property, you cannot deny me because I owe utilities. Okay, now, having said that, if I live in Cary and I decide I want to move to Wake Forest or wherever, and the utility provider where I left from was Duke Energy, and I get to Wake Forest and it's still Duke Energy, you can deny me if I owe Duke Energy money because they are not going to turn the utilities on if you, if you owe them money. Contrary to what people will tell you, they do not have to give you power if you owe them money. So if I owe Duke Energy money and I've applied to your property and that's who provides your utilities, you're gonna to say to the applicant and to DHHS, we can't deny that we can't approve them because they owe Duke Energy money and they won't turn the utilities on in the unit. I mean, you can't live in the unit without utilities. DHHS is then gonna work with the applicant and or their service provider to get that bill paid. So they can clear that off their credit and that will not be a barrier. So that is the only time that you should be denying someone as it relates to credit, all right? Because that is not a, an economic reason. All right, now, if you, I'm assuming you guys still do landlord references. You call, say Louise has applied at your property and her previous landlord was Wanda. Wanda, you guys send Wanda a um, landlord reference, you know, ask all the questions, you know, do they abide by the lease, do they owe you money, da, 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 whatever your questions are. And Wanda responds, when Louise left here, she owed me $1,200. In the property management world, same rule applies. If you owe them rent when you leave, you will owe me rent when you leave, and therefore I will deny you. You cannot deny Louise because she owes a previous landlord $1,200 just for that reason, because you have access to special claims. So when Louise moves out, if she owes you money, you can file for special claims and be reimbursed for those costs or a portion of those costs. However, when Louise moved out from Wanda's, Wanda's left holding the bag because she didn't have access to special claims. That's the difference in how it relates to economic nature versus not, okay? Now, if Wanda fills out the verification, and I'm assuming on your landlord reference forms you put on there, about, ask questions about lease violations or things of that nature. Wanda puts on there that um, Louise had five lease violations related to noise, unauthorized occupants, whatever, all right? Those are not economic related. That doesn't have anything to do with money. That means Louise did not follow the rules and abide by the lease. For that reason, you can deny her because that is not an economic nature, all right? Now, having said that, we'll talk about individualized assessments in a minute, but you need to look at the whole situation. But if that is what the landlord says, that would be a reason to deny Louise because she got a bad landlord reference. The fact that she owed Wanda is not, a, is not a deal breaker, but the fact that she maybe um, had damages as it related to behavioral issues or things of that nature, then that is a problem. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about criminal. 
because that tends to be where the hiccup comes majority of the time. If an applicant has an arrest pending, all right, you need to look at the situation and consider this as part of an individualized assessment. If I have a pending charge of misdemeanor shoplifting or misdemeanor trespassing or whatever the charge may be that is pending, and if I get, if I get convicted of that, I'm still going to get to live at your property. It don't matter because that's not a deal breaker. Don't make me wait until I go to court to get those results from that because the results going to be the same. Whether I don't have it on my record or I do have it on my record, if your tenant selection policy says I can still live there, you don't need to put my application on hold pending the outcome of those charges. All right. So that's what we're saying when you need to look at the situation as a whole. All right. All right. If you can look at the, um, but now if there are situations, say if it's a felony drug possession or felony assault, something of that nature that's pending, your tenant selection policy may be that if I get convicted of those things, I would not be able to live at your property. So you may say to myself and to let DHHS know, they have pending um, charges that would prohibit them from being a resident here until they get that resolved. We can't approve their application. That's the difference. That's part of the individualized assessment, meaning you're looking at the entire situation. All right. If the housing provider can um, look at the specifics like we talked about, go ahead and process the application as if they had already been convicted or if there is no charge, because that's, you know, the result will be the same. Don't hold it up for that reason. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit more about um, the individualized assessment. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But if an applicant has a disability and requests a reasonable accommodation, you need to, the, the service provider who is the one that's helping them prepare this needs to look at that and determine if the request is going to be appropriate while the pr criminal charges are pending. All right. Does the reason, does their disability, is it tied to their behavior or the situation that happened? Because if, it, if there's no direct correlation with it, your request is going to be denied. So that's why a lot of times they've got the service providers working with them because they know more about the situation. They can, they'll tell DHHS right up front, no, there's not even no need. This is not about that or whatever the situation is. So again, if they submit a reasonable accommodation request, you are holding that unit until it's determined. If it takes you three weeks, that unit is offline for three weeks. Do not lease that to someone else and then say, well, we looked at it, we'll approve them so they can have the next unit. No, it does not work that way. You have to hold the unit for them while you're reviewing it. So this individualized assessment, essentially what this is, is you're gonna look at the seriousness of the criminal offense, the relationship between the offense and the safety and security of your residents and your staff, and the length of time it's been since that occurred. All right, and the age of the household member at the time of the offense and the number of convictions that they've had or situations that they've had and any evidence of rehabilitation, you know, have they gotten a job, have they been a productive member of society, do they have a um, sponsor within a program that they're in that would give them a good reference, you know, that sort of thing. Make sure that you're also looking at if this person has a service provider and that service provider is able to pro provide them services like you know learning how to budget their money and things of that nature all of those things need to play into your individualized assessment okay yes you know they're kind of borderline we could deny them but because they've got all these positive things that have happened in their situation we're going to approve them as part of this individualized assessment um, one of the examples that we often use is if anyone knows Louise, they know that Louise loves to fish and she loves a boat. All right. Well, I had no idea, but if you have a boat and you're in a no wake zone and you make a wake, they give you a ticket for that. And evidently that can be a felony. Well, if you have a tenant selection policy at your property, which we do not allow you to have, that says anybody convicted of any kind of felony can't live at our property. Okay. Maybe you have a teenager. I'm probably, I'm sure everybody that's on this call today or that is in this room has a telephone. All right, and if they have a child that has a phone, 
you know, we're all old and know nothing, you know, and nothing happens unless they take a picture of it and it's not official till it's Facebook official or Instagram official or what's that new thing now where everybody's dancing, TikTok or something, okay. All right, so they're smart, they know everything. You know, they take pictures of things and nobody will know because nobody's gonna see my phone. Well, inevitably they share it with a friend. Well, the friend's mom sees the picture. Well, the picture's inappropriate. Some parents would call that child's parents and we'd have a come to Jesus meeting about the pictures. Other parents, decide I'm calling the police well depending on the nature of the picture your child and any child that shared that picture could get charged for that and end up being a um, sex offender for the rest of their life because they shared pictures on the internet or via phone because they're so smart and we know nothing all right so say this happens to them 16 17 18 years old you know well when they're 42 years old, they come to your property, apply for a unit at your property. And if it's Louise, your plan says everybody with a, nobody with a felony can live here ever. And if it's your child and they've come there to apply and they have a ten tenant selection policy that says we don't lease to anybody that's a sex offender. So then you've cut your child out, okay? Well, since your child that has that issue since they're middle school, high school, whatever age they are, they've gone on, they've gone to college, you know, they may have got a speeding ticket or whatever, but you know, they've gone to college, they've graduated, they've got a good job, they have good rental references. They appear to be the ideal tenant. You know, you got a good landlord reference, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you pay your rent and you don't cause any trouble, you're a good tenant, you know? Well, you have to deny them for that reason, just because that's what your tenant selection policy says. All right, in Louise's case, I personally would le lease to the person that had that on there. You know, obviously they've learned from that. They've got some rehab. There you go, you know, 20 some years and not had any issues. All right, that's part of your individualized assessment. You're looking at that. In Louise's case, you know, maybe I wouldn't ride in a boat with her, but if you got a good rental reference, you know, she pays her rent, she's good. You know, those are things that you look at when you're, when somebody says, well, the individualized assessment okay and you're making notes of this so if someone comes back and asks you about it if you're like me you're not going to remember what happened this morning by this afternoon somebody's going to come back and ask you at some point in time and you're like holy crap and then you pull it out you've got your notes you're able to you know say this is why you made your decision now you are not required to overturn every denial with an individualized assessment that is not the reason for that the reason for that is essentially saying we're asking you to take another look at this and look at the entire situation everything around it and then if you do and you still deny it take good notes and write it down because eventually someone's going to call you and ask about it and nine times out of ten i'm going to be the one that's going to call you and ask about it because you know everybody at our office wants data and when somebody's denied they're tracking that data and they're reporting it to the Department of Justice and they're reporting it to DHHS. So then all of a sudden they say, well, why did this person get denied? Well, I go back, call you on the phone. You're like, holy crap, Sandy, that was three months ago. Give me a minute. So you pull out your file, you've got your notes there. You can tell me why. I make a note, life's good, we move on. Take good notes, again, just make sure that your position is justified and you, you won't have any trouble. But take the notes so you can remember it. Having said that, if any of you guys are like some of us in our office, we're in a lottery pool, and if we win the lottery pool, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be the person that's going to be able to answer your question. So you're going to leave the, your friends that are left behind, you're going to leave them good information. So, of course, any of this that you do, you have to put in vacancy and referral. Update it as you go along. Do not wait until the very end. Because if you wait until the very end, it reflects poorly either on you or DHHS, depending on the situation. If I apply today and I'm, your property's, you know, not under construction or anything of that, and I get approved, and three months from now, we run information in the system and it shows that your, the application's approved or still being processed, it looks very or on the management company to think why in the world does it take them three months to review an application something is wrong now I can go in vacancy and referral and if you've got comments in the system that says I'm missing a verification or I've got this I can figure out part of the problem is you haven't gotten all the information from your referral 
my then question to you is, have you asked DHHS for a hold fee? It's been three months. You shouldn't have to hold the unit this long. And did you let DHHS know? You know, so again, all of these things lead back to something else. So make sure you're updating vacancy and referral on time. Those reasons for denial that I told you you have to answer the questions in the system, you can pretty much guarantee that if you tag somebody as being denied for a landlord reference or for credit, you're going to get a phone call from me at some point in time. It's probably not going to be immediate, but three months from now when somebody runs a report, they're going to say, oh, they're not supposed to be denied for credit. Why did you deny them? So I'm going to call you and ask you, why did you deny them for credit? So again, they're tracking all the denials, so just make sure you're prepared to answer questions. Again, not saying that you're doing anything wrong, but just somewhere down the line, there's somebody else asking. And of course, the targeting program is in an effort not only to house people with disabilities, but as part of the Olmstead Act, the Department of Justice said that the um, state of North Carolina was not allowing people with disabilities to be housed within the community. So this is one of the ways that we are responding back to them saying, yes, we are meeting your requirements and trying to give them the opportunity to live within the community. If you're not updating the system timely, or if DHHS isn't doing something timely, the only thing we have to go by is what the computer spits out as far as data. So that's why we, when we say the proof is in the pudding, when we send it to whoever gets it, you don't get the opportunity to, it's kind of like a news story. You don't get the opportunity to tell your story twice. So just make sure that you get it in there. Also, if you deny, if somebody has appealed, all right, first of all, if DHHS asks me to review a denial, I have to review it. They don't do that very often on the initial denial, but they do at times, but they feel like there's an issue. But any person that is denied and they submit an appeal, I have to review those. So just know if you deny somebody that has appealed and you continue to deny them and you do not let them move in, you will get a phone call from me. So please take very good notes on that so when I call you, I can make good notes in the system and we can move on and we don't have to recreate the wheel. So if you deny somebody that does an appeal, we will reach out and figure out exactly why because those are always the ones the Department of Justice asks us about. We have to have information about that. We know they're going to ask anybody that is denied on appeal. We have to know why. So know that we'll ask that. The next thing you have to do is in vacancy and referral that Wanda talked a little bit about is you have to confirm that they've moved in. You put in the system, oh, they're, you know, yes, they're approved, they're going to move in February the 15th. Well, you have to go back in vacancy and referral and confirm that they actually moved in on February the 15th. That is part of the process. Make sure that you do that. Like Wanda said again, the two systems talk to each other somewhat, but not to the point to where one system updates the other. Just because you put it in vacancy and referral, it is not going into RCRS. If you put it in RCRS, it does not update vacancy and referral. So make sure that you're updating that. And then once you've entered it in vacancy and referral, there's a work list up there that says awaiting move-in verification checklist. Again, that's just asking you one more time, make sure that what they did was right. And the one thing that I will stress is if you reserve unit 100 for them and they change their mind, before you go through the entire process in vacancy and referral, and they change their mind to go in unit 500, please undo the vacancy reservation for the first unit and change it to 500. Because if you don't, at some point down the line, once you put it in there and confirm it, there is no changing that without a help desk ticket at this point. Even if you get it to DHHS and they're like, they didn't move in that unit, they moved in another one, they cannot help you at that point. Until we get the system enhanced, it, you have to live with that. Well, then what happens is people say you have to live with that until somebody starts running data. And then they can't live with it anymore. And then we have to submit a help desk ticket. And we've had quite a few of those lately. In one sense, my hope is that all of these help desk tickets will encourage our IT department to put us further at the top of the list to get some of these things fixed that we could allow y'all the ability to fix in the field or that we could fix. But until then, please don't do that. If you do, um, we have to do a help desk ticket. We basically have to take it back to where it was at and then get you to start all over again. And you guys don't want to start all over again. It's not one of those things to where we fix it in the system. Oh, no, that would be too easy. I can't just submit a help desk ticket and say change this from this to this. No. They take it back to the approved status or pending vacancy um, 
reservation and you guys have to fix it on your end and then that means DHHS has to get it again and back and forth. So again, make sure the information is correct before you confirm the move in. Again, any questions, no matter how small or how trivial you think they may be, reach out to Wanda, myself, Louise, between the three of us, we will figure out how to get it right in vacancy and referral. Here's an example of the um, move-in confirmation and vacancy and referral. It basically tells you in your um, awaiting move-in confirmation, there's one referral there for Kensington Gardens, all right? And it tells you the date they were approved and the date they were expected to move in. So essentially, they're waiting for you on the 13th to confirm that they moved in. You cannot do it earlier. You have to wait until. And if you do it earlier, they will not move in on the 13th, and then that will cause a data discrepancy between vacancy and referral and RCRS, and you will hear from me. It's Murphy's Law. Oh, and they promised me they're going to move in that day. It won't happen. So, again, don't confirm it until they've actually signed the lease, got the keys, and are on to bigger and better things. So, your actions tab in order to confirm this move in, as you see where it says confirm move in, you're going to choose the confirm move in, and you see this is where you have the option to change the vacancy reservation. You undo and then pick the right unit. Once you do that, then you're picking the unit that they actually moved into. So this person evidently moved into unit 129. Whatever unit they move into needs to be the same unit that you have reserved for their vacancy. If it's not, this is a place that you will catch it. Stop, don't go any further, and call somebody to help you or um, just undo the vacancy reservation. If, when it gets over to RCRS, and this is where the issue comes in at that starts the snowball effect. In vacancy and referral, <clears throat> excuse me, if you put in that Louise moved in unit 100, but then when you put it in vacancy and referral, it's going to show that Louise moved in unit 500, we have to confirm the two systems data. And that's where we figure out that is wrong. So again, that's how we're confirming that the data in the two systems match. So again, if it's the wrong one has been con um, confirmed, you cannot change it, reach out to us and let us know. Don't wait, just call us and say, we're human, we make mistakes, all of us every day. Just call us and say, I made a mistake, can you help me? We can go ahead and submit the help desk ticket. My hope is that when we get some IT time, they can make this an enhancement and that it would be something that um, our staff or DHHS could undo for you and not involve all this, all these help desk tickets. So, okay. Um, another thing that was brought up is the tenant's name in the system is different than the tenant name on the referral letter. Um, probably not a good example, but you know the referral letter is should have their given name that is on their ID, okay? So if I get a referral letter, mine should say Sandra Harris, okay? Everyone calls me Sandy, all right? So if someone at DHHS puts Sandy on that and then I get to the property, the property is going to put what's on my ID, which would be Sandra. Well, that's pretty close. I can figure out, you know, Sandy, Sandra, Sandra, whatever. That's pretty good. But now there are times when they put Robert and then you got William. I mean, I mean, that's really different. So if the name on the referral letter doesn't match what you put in RCRS, we're going to kick it back for that reason. So make sure that the two match. And junior and senior matter. Because you do have cases where junior and senior both get a referral. And if you don't put the right information in the system, it's going to appear that the same person is living at two properties. So again, junior, senior, first, second, third, all of that matters. So just make sure that you put that in the system. All right, some of the top findings that we have in vacancy and referral, probably the most common is that you're not reporting your vacancies and you're not reporting them timely. As soon as you find out you're going to have a vacant unit, let DHHS know. Another big one is that you're reporting incorrect um, unit features. When you get, have a unit come available, if that unit's handicap accessible, you need to note that in the referral. If that unit is not handicap accessible, you do not need to report that vacancy as that because DHHS uses that information to send referrals to your property. And that makes for a very awkward situation when someone shows up at your property anticipating that they're going to be able to get their wheelchair in, their, in your unit and then they cannot. 
So again, we talked about earlier on that property profile sheet and the property characteristics. There's information on that sheet about units that are accessible that you provide to the property, to DHHS and to our staff. But if you don't know the accessibility features of your unit, get up and go to the unit. You can walk in that unit and you should be able to know if the property is um, handicap accessible, if the unit's handicap accessible, you know, if it has the audio and visual um, features, that sort of thing. And again, earlier in the book, we talk about how the um, two words are interchangeable, but they mean the same thing. So make sure that you have that information. <clears throat> We also have times to where we have people ask for the release of a unit prior to meeting the requirement. Um, DHHS sometimes will release a unit early, but only if they don't have referrals. All right, so if they don't have referrals, reach out to them and say, you know, if you don't have any referrals, can we release this before 30 days or before 90 days? Okay, they will do that, but you've got to ask them. You just can't release it on yourself. Um, we talked about reserving one unit, but they move into another. Also, very, very, very important. In life, unfortunately, there are times that there has to be a waiver to a rule or an exception to a rule. And the hope is that when DHHS sends you a referral, that they will know that information up front and they can, in addition to uploading the referral letter, they can upload any waiver letter that you may need. It is much better than it has been in the past, but it is by far from perfect. We do not live in a perfect world. Please look back in vacancy and referral before you take time to fill out all of their paperwork that you're anticipating that they're going to sign when they come for the lease signing. DHHS may have uploaded a waiver letter that will impact the tenant's rent and the subsidy portions, and you don't want to get left holding the bag because if you don't use that information, nobody's really going to know until you send the file to Louise for review. And then Louise is gonna send the file back because you haven't used the waiver letter. Well then, Wanda talked about how you may have told the tenant that their rent is less than what it should be, but because you've signed the documents, you've gotta live with that for the next year. So, always double check vacancy and referral before you sign all the documents. We talked about not uploading the denial letters timely. Make sure you are doing that timely. It's very important that you're doing that. All right, if you have questions about the targeting program or vacancy and referral, if it's about payments or file issues, reach out to Louise. DHHS has no idea about the payments. You know, they can look in there and see basic information, but you guys don't ever want just basic information. I mean, you guys want down and dirty, as my daughter would say, the juicy details. So if you have questions about those things, reach out to Louise, she can help you. If you have questions about how to use vacancy and referral, Wanda should be your first point of contact. She knows how to use the system. She knows it backwards and forwards, but there are times she's like all of us, we need to get somebody else to look at this. You can reach out to me about that. Now, if you're having a technical issue with vacancy and referral, reach out to me because I have to work with our IT team to get that fixed. And by technical issue, it is not working as it's intended. It is not allowing you to upload a denial letter, but it should allow you to upload a denial letter. The mere fact that you do not know how to work in vacancy and referral is not a technical issue. So don't send a panicked email that the system is not working as it's intended. That's an education thing and we can work with you with that. But these emails get elevated based on the priority of them and that you know kind of sends everybody into a stir if they think the system's gonna break. So another thing that I will point out, all throughout our system, if you have an issue, especially in RCRS, it says, report your question to compliance help at nchfa.com, I think is what it says. If you have questions about vacancy and referral or targeting questions, do not send those to compliance help. Send those directly to Louise or to myself. And the reason I say that is, is because that compliance help email is being used by everybody that's part of the um, tax credit program that has access to RCRS. So Tanya monitors that email on a regular basis. We just have to be using, using it today for questions. And because of the volume that comes in, it may be several days before somebody gets back to you. We don't have that many questions as it relates to that. So if you send them directly to Louise or to myself, we can get back to you faster. 
So if you have questions, email or um, contact us directly if it's related to the targeting program or to vacancy and referral. All right, so let me look and see about our questions. Bear with me, let's see what we have here. All right, I just remembered I was supposed to say something at the top of this. I do apologize. If you are having buffering issues or whatever, you may want to refresh your um, screen, but I'm sure all of you have figured that out at this point. So 45 minutes later, I do apologize. So um, I don't see any questions. Are you seeing, do you have any, Louise? Okay, I don't see whether there are any questions. Does anybody in the room here have any questions? Okay, well, in that case, Louise is going to come up and talk about the targeting program. short people problems <clears throat> okay so we're going to talk about the targeting program and as Sandy stated I'm Louise Gardner and I'm the one that well me and a few others review your files when you guys submit them and if in future you have questions please make sure you're reaching out because uh, we all try to assist you as much as we can <clears throat> um, one thing I'm going to mention right to start with because I have people that call me and they're like, uh, we didn't get our targeting payment. Or this person's no longer receiving key, so they're not targeted. Targeting is the program itself. Um, that is the program that we, um, you know, you guys or the owners commit to providing units to targeted households who have disabilities. That's part of the program. Key is the assistance type that you can receive on your property. You know, you may get a targeted household that's referred to you that has a Section 8 voucher. So remember always that that targeting program, that's the program. The key assistance is just a, an additional fund that um, is out there to help them pay rent if they don't have uh, a voucher or other um, options. So annually, 10% of any newly funded prop, uh, units tar are targeted to individuals with disabilities. In 2016, it's required that bond properties also participate in the targeting program. You will have a targeting unit agreement. The individual must be referred by a service provider who has made a commitment to participate. Housing with access to supports and services, and we're talking about if you have that stuff on site, but it's not required that you have it. <clears throat> Look at there. <laughs> I did that, y'all, just so you know. I like having a live audience. You know, it's filmed in front of a live audience. Doesn't that sound awesome? Anyway, so um, the targeting unit agreement gives the uh, owner, property management, and DHHS information as it relates to how many units you're required to have on your property, how many targeted units. Um, you know, we mentioned a property that has, um, say, 40 units, you're required to have four. It's 10% of however many units. Now, if you have, you know, 38 units, it's still going to be four. If it's 33 units, it's still four. So you're always going to go up that next one if it's a, a property that has an odd number instead of a straight um, 10, 20, or 30. Again, um, it's going to talk about what type of rental assistance, whether you're going to have key on your property, or you may have project-based rental assistance on your property, or RD. So it's going to give that information on that unit targeted unit agreement. It also discusses the roles and responsibilities um, of the parties. You know, what is your responsibility as it relates to letting DHHS know about vacant units, et cetera. 
So your tenant selection plan. Hopefully site managers have a copy hanging up in their office, they should, or somewhere on a wall. But you need to also know what your tenant selection policy says. Um, make sure you have a copy again and understand what it's saying. If you don't know, reach out to your management company. If you don't understand what it's saying, make sure you're reaching out. Um, if your property is an elderly tax credit property, there's a certain definition that you guys have to select. Um, and so it's the tax credit elderly is 55 and older, right? 80% of the units have to be 55 and older. Because of um, the Olmstead, we require that you cannot make 100% of your units 55 and older. Um, and this is re requirement applies regardless of the date, the agency funding, or the year of allocation that you cannot make your property 100% at 55. If your property states that, again, please reach out to your management company and make sure that's updated because it is a requirement that you let households 45 years of age and older in a certain amount, a percentage. Because most of the time, well, the tax credit rule reads 80% are 55 and older, and then the 20%, the owners designate what that age is. But again, they can't make it 100% at 55. There's got to be that lenience for that 45 years and older. And Sandy, are you going to keep an eye for the questions? Thank you, ma'am. So having being eligible for the targeting program, I know that Wanda mentioned it, but if someone comes into your property and says, you know, I'm struggling and I'm disabled and I don't have funds, don't say, well, we, you know, there's a targeting program and there's key rental assistance. Don't do that. We do not advertise this program. The households that come in or that get a letter of referral come from a, a you know, a lead agency, and those groups have participate with DHHS, um, you can certainly refer them to 211, but don't refer them to 211 saying, this is the answer, tell them you want key. Don't, don't do that. That is not what that 211 is for. 211 is resources for you guys. If you have residents on site that are having maybe some monetary issues or something's going on, you would refer them to 211. And we actually had discussed, you know, this before. It's not, it's not that we don't want you advertising this program because there are levels, as um, Wanda Teal indicated, you know, there's four different levels that you guys don't know anything about. And that's how they rate the referral. That's how they get referred to your property. Don't just refer someone or tell them about the program. Refer them to other agencies, other programs, like I said, 211, and hopefully they'll be able to help them. But when you mention to someone at a site level, although there's a program, they start calling us and saying, well, the site manager said I'm approved. I've just got to get the key assistance. I can get a targeting referral letter. They don't understand, and it just adds to the confusion and their frustrations more so at you guys because you have told them a little bit but not enough for them to understand that they may or may not qualify for it. So just make sure that you're not giving out information to applicants or others about this program. This is a sample of the letter of referral. And as Wanda indicated, a lot of times we uh, call it the LOR. Hopefully um, you guys know what that is. But this letter that you guys get gives you very specific information. What type of subsidy are they going to get? You know, is it going to be key, project-based, Section 8 voucher? Um, and there's others, uh, types of funding that they can receive. One thing I want to call attention to, because I get this question asked all the time, at the bottom it says number of household members. It may say one, it could say four, whatever, and then it tells you a unit size. So let's say that someone gave you a letter of referral and it says two people in a two-bedroom unit. 
when the applicant comes in and fills out the application, there's five names on that, and they're asking for a three-bedroom. If you rent to that person a three-bedroom unit, when this letter clearly states two-bedroom, you will only get the amount for a two-bedroom unit. So that's the reason that the number of unit is there. It's not so that they don't have to write a waiver, because you're still going to have to have a bedroom waiver if you've got one, two, and three bedrooms. Um, and let's say they did refer them to a three-bedroom, or they referred the two people or one person to a one-bedroom, <coughs> excuse me, a one person to a two-bedroom, and, you know, you still have to have that waiver letter if you have one, two, and three bedrooms. This does not negate that. When you get a letter of referral, if they indicate a two-bedroom and you only see that there's one person listed here and you know you have one, two, and three bedrooms, make sure it's in your system because they should be uploading that waiver letter when they upload this uh, letter of referral in vacancy and referral. So go ahead and look to see if you've got that waiver letter. As you're processing this application and you don't have it, you still got time to reach out to them to go ahead and get it. The time is not to be after the person's moved in, after you've submitted the file, and then I have to return the file and say, you need to reach out to DHHS to get this waiver letter. Because you're stopping your process and you're stopping you guys getting paid for that unit for something that you could have taken care of on the front end. Does anybody have any questions about that? Everybody good? Know what the letter of referral looks like. So they must have a targeting program letter, again, of referral. Um, and again, the most current has the eligible bedroom size on it. Other eligibility requirements are determined by the type of rental assistance that they get. So if they're getting key assistance, again, they've got to have the letter of referral. The head of household must have income based on a disability. That's SSI, SSDI, or VA. The total household income cannot exceed the state mandated 50% area median income. <clears throat> One thing I want to mention is some people have properties that are straight 60%. If you have targeted units, you still have to meet that requirement. So if you don't know what your 50% area median income is, you need to reach out and let us show you where it's at. Because even though your property is 100% at 60%, you're still required to make sure that these targeted households don't exceed the 50%. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. The minimum gross income is $300 a month and they must meet the household size per bedroom size standard, and again, unless they have a waiver. So the other rental assistance, again, they've got to have a LOR. Verification of disability or homeless status according to the rent assistance and the program rules for that property. The household income requirements according to, again, the program requirements for that specific property. Remember, disability income that comes from employment, such as short-term or long-term disability, is not eligible for this program. So if, in fact, you guys got someone referred and that's all they brought you, don't process that application until you reach back out to DHHS and say, you know, based on what we're receiving from the household, they're only getting short-term disability. That's the only income that they've indicated. This does not qualify them. DHHS is aware of that, and they may have already a, know that the person's fixing to get a Social Security or VA, or you know there may be other things that you guys just don't see, but don't process this until you get the information that you need to process it. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> you knew why I was looking, right? Okay. And I didn't know what you were doing. I, you just, yeah. Okay, sorry. 
All right, so now we're going to talk about waivers. DHHS does provide um, management with waivers. Again, those waivers should come at the same time that the letter of referral is uploaded into vacancy and referral. Having said that, sometimes it gets missed by you or DHHS. Um, you know, one little step is missed, and it and it happens. Um, but make sure if you know that that household is a one-person household moving into a two-bedroom, you already know you have one, two, and threes. You got to have that waiver letter. So reach out and say, I need this uploaded. Before you move them in to your property, make sure you're looking back in vacancy and referral. Um, so the different types of waivers are unit size waiver, the income waiver, disability waiver, and then the NC transitions program waiver. And the one that we're going to talk the most about is the transitions waiver. Um, these letters have changed somewhat. Um, they're not all the same. So make sure when you receive one, you are looking at it in its entirety before you start doing everything. Um, I had a management company that didn't realize that there's an update event that was supposed to be completed. Or I've seen where they just automatically assumed that there was going to be that three months free rent, and there wasn't. So make sure you're looking at the individual letter that you're receiving, because sometimes it states you know, we have verified this household's income at $8,700 a year. We want you to do X amount monthly for this, for the entirety, for the for first full year. And this person will have to, you know, reapply or whatever. So make sure you're looking at your letter and don't just assume that it that they're the same because they have changed in the last year or so. Um, but for the case of this one... <coughs> The letter indicates the amount used to calculate the subsidy and tenant portion for the first 120 days. And most of the time, you're going to do a $1 override in our system, in RCRS, so that the tenant for the first 120 days is paying zero rent and they're getting all, all, you're getting all the money in subsidy payments. Make sure you upload all the documents as you would any other move-in unit event, including that transitions waiver letter. And that is so important because that lets us know there's supposed to be an update done, right? So, again, upload the only things that you're going to upload in that second update event is the key calculation worksheet, the key lease addendum, and that transition waiver letter. Those are the only three required documents. Sometimes the system won't allow you to close it without you uploading the letter of referral again. So you may have to do that. But those are the three required documents with that update event. Again, it's going to give you specific information as far as what to count for income. The amounts on the forms should reflect the amounts referenced in the waiver letter, and that is the amount that should be entered into RCRS. At that point on the update event, no income override is required. If a household received a waiver from DHHS, the waiver or an updated waiver must be included in the uploads for recertification. Hold the bus, okay? I'm going to tell you now, it is a requirement. If your household has a waiver letter, whether it be bedroom size, whatever, that you received, make sure that you are uploading a copy of it in those research for two reasons. One is because I don't want to dig back through six years trying to find the initial one because sometimes there are different percentages that are used for whatever reasons the situations can be different. So normally you see one person moving into a two bedroom, the waiver letter reads 25%. However, they don't all read that way. Some of them say 20%. Because, again, there are side situations that we're not aware of, but DHHS is. So they're indicating 20%. I don't want to have to look back every year 
at every single file that comes through trying to figure out what did their waiver letter say. Because inevitably, management is going to forget to put the one-bedroom override, or they're going to forget to upload the waiver letter. There's just so many possibilities. So I'm going to give you advance warning when these files come in. If they don't have the waiver letter as far as bedroom size, those files will be returned, period, across the board. So I'm letting everybody know most bedroom waivers will include that you will have to request a new one or that you don't. But they all indicate that you must upload at each recertification. If um, you get a letter, like, as this one is, and this is um, regarding disability income, this is a different type of waiver letter, but if you look where I've highlighted and have in yellow and blocked around, it tells you they will not need to apply for it the next, the next recertification. So this was a one-time deal. They're going to be getting their disability income. You guys will be able to verify it. But for this, they had to provide a waiver. <clears throat> now with this one, it's a, again an example. It tells you the tenant will need to reapply. So you're 120 days out. You give the applicant his research questionnaire. Look back through their file and look if you had any letters or make a note on the outside of it so that you know to go ahead and reach out to DHHS. You're 120 days out, right? You're already sending them a notice letting them know you're recertifying them. Let them know that you were supposed to alert them that this person may need another waiver. DHHS has the opportunity and time to go in and figure out what they need. If you wait till after you recertify them and then you're scrambling trying to get this information, you are delaying the whole process, your payments, and you're going to be in state noncompliance. So make sure that you are <coughs> looking at these letters, make sure you're making your notes and following our guidelines because it's so important that these are not delayed. So this one is a unit size waiver. Four person in a four bedroom, it tells you they will not need to reapply for another one. But let's say in two years, someone moves out. You have to go back to DHHS and let them know there are no longer four people in the household. Um, could you provide us with another waiver? <coughs> and so, DHHS makes the determination to whether to provide you an additional waiver. Um, they're going to request that the household be moved to a smaller unit, or they will provide the waiver but request that when a unit comes available that you move them to that unit. So what if the household goes down to one person? You're still going to reach back out to DHHS. Anytime there is a change a decrease in household size, you're reaching out to DHHS saying, okay, we got one person in a three bedroom unit. What are we, you know, what are we going to do? Don't have any one bedrooms available. DHHS ultimately makes the determination you have to have a new waiver letter when household size decreases. So make sure that you're getting that information. Or again, once you guys submit the file, those are going to be returned. So make sure you have an updated waiver letter if something's changed in the household, if it's decreased in size. I think my helper went to sleep on me right there. Okay, thank you, dear. Um, do you want me to go ahead and touch this one and then, okay. Um, so live in AIDS. With live-in aides, management is still going to screen them for criminal history just as they do anyone else coming in to the property. Make sure you're providing verification of need. That's going to be obtained by management. You have to provide that when you upload those documents um, in RCRS to us. One thing I'm going to mention, you'll probably hear me mention again, a spouse can never be a live-in aide. 
Um, additional live-in aid family members are not allowed to reside in the unit. Now, I know that HUD has different regulations and different requirements, but as far as um, DHHS, this program is concerned, if that um, live-in aid tries to bring their children, grandchildren, et cetera, then they are no longer a live-in aid. So make sure you remember that. And if you need assistance or guidance, please reach out to us and we'll try to assist you to make sure we do this correctly. Now, if Jane and her mother move on to the property and they're a targeted household, Jane is a targeted uh, resident. All of a sudden, on a restart, Mary, the mother, changes and says, I'm the living aid, and they bring you a document. Can she be the living aid? No. Once they are a resident in that household and they're residing in that unit, they cannot be changed to a live-in aid. <clears throat> so what makes a live-in aid no longer be qualified? If, again, they bring other family members into the unit, when there is no longer a need for a live-in aid, um, they are no longer entitled to live in that unit. If they marry the household member or if they move out or the resident moves out. Now, I will say, and this happened to me, so this household moved in with a live-in aid, and they resided on the property probably two or three years. And I was looking, well, no, I didn't catch it then. So they filled out the paperwork, two more years go by, and the person is listed as a spouse. So I start going back through the application on one of them, the research questionnaires, excuse me, on one of them, it indicated that he was a fiance. And so I'm like, okay, they can't be married and him be a living aid. So I reached out to the property. I returned the file and said, this is what we've got. This person indicates that they got married, blah, blah, blah. Well, they came back and said, no, we didn't. We're, we're not married. That was, she just accidentally wrote that. Well, super sleuth, I'm not going to say who it was. Because <laughs> um, we're smart like that. We realized they did get married. And, you know, social media being what it is, there were wed wedding pictures and everything else. So, um, you know, then they wanted to come back and argue because the gentleman was receiving a huge monthly payment to take care of her. So we're not exactly sure how long they had been married. I don't know if that was ever. Of course, they wound up moving. But um, that is pay attention to your research questionnaires. Pay attention to the information that these residents are giving you to make sure that you're doing your due diligence because that's all it is. I'm sure if that management company had seen that, they'd have been like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, but, you know, as long as we're doing our due diligence and trying to make sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do, we can roll on. You you know, the management company didn't know that they had gotten married. They certainly didn't go into the office and report it. They didn't. <laughs> Stop it. They didn't catch it, you know, and, and it's unfortunate. And, you know, again, some people are nosy, not mentioning any names. So I do dig a little bit probably and look at different situations. And when something changes within the year to year, because – Ultimately, that's what you guys all should be doing. When you get your research package, stop. What, what was last year? Did anything change? You know, people move out, but also all of a sudden this income comes in and you're like, okay, they didn't report this last year. And when you get the verification back, it says they started that job two years ago, right? Could you have done anything different? No, because you can only verify what they provide you. But did they commit fraud? Absolutely. And so that's when you need to stop and reach out to your management company and say, this person didn't report that they were employed when they moved in, but it's showing up now and on the verification they were truly employed when they came to us. Can people get Social Security and still work? Some better than others. I will tell you that a lot of times on the Social Security letter, it'll have seven pages. Have y'all seen those? Yeah, right? 
So on the seventh page, it says, so much is being deducted because of wages. I'm sending that file back, guys. You guys got to figure out. I can't do it because I'm not there. Would I like to do it? Probably. I used to love that on site. Um, Because, again, nosy girl. But make sure that you're doing your due diligence. Look at things. Look at the previous year. Look at what you're verifying. Don't just verify it because it says $10 and 20 hours a week and you move on. Look at things. What day did they start? Because we're looking at that. And that protects those owners' tax credits. So while, yes, I'm up here talking about targeting and key, you guys still have to stay in compliance across the board, right? We all want... We're partners, and we all want us to succeed in this. So it's very important that, you know, we make sure that we're verifying everything that we can. If the resident moves out and leaves the live-in aid, are they eligible to stay at your property? <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> Just remember, no. And, and also, um, make sure you're reaching out to DHHS as soon as possible. Um, and we're going to talk about different scenarios and things that can happen, but, you know, Across the board, make sure that you're doing your due diligence because that's covering you and you're protecting those owner's tax credits. And, Sandy, I'm going to call a halt if that's okay. Are there any questions? Okay, so, guys, there's no questions. And we are going to go ahead and do our lunch break. And we're going to return at at 1.30. And we know that's, you know, an hour and a half here, guys. But... For those who are here and trying to get out and get lunch and get back, we want to make sure everybody has time. So we will be back at 1.30, um, and thank you. Okay, and we're back from our lunch break. If you can't see your screen, you might want to hit refresh. Even if you can, you still might want to hit refresh. I'm not sure how that works, but I did hear Sandy mention that. Um. Before we left, we did talk about live-in aids, and we did not have any other questions as it relates to that. I did have someone mention that they had a household move-in, and the person had indicated a live-in aid, and she brought her children. And again, can't stress it enough, the live-in there it, aid is there to uh, help the resident uh, be able to enjoy his residence at your property. Um, if they bring other members with them, they're no longer considered a, a live-in aid. They're another household member. So, you know, make sure you're reaching out to DHHS to let them know of the situation, but also make sure that the resident is aware that that person cannot be considered a live-in aid. So key rental assistance. <clears throat> this assistance is state-funded. Uh, rental assi assistance to subsidize the rents of the tenants that are referred through the targeting program. I'm making sure my clicker's on, sorry guys. Um, this is limited to households that the head has a disability and that the income has been verified based on their disability, either Social Security, SSDI, or VA. You will receive the key payment standard. The amount is set by DHHS and NCHFA. Um, the owner has to sign an agreement to participate. The property management company is responsible for verifying their eligibility for the programs on their property. So if you have a straight tax credit property and it's 60%, again, you're making sure that they qualify for that, as well as making sure that they qualify for this program at the 50% area median income. Um, if you have home funds on your property or any other types of funds, you're going to make sure that person is eligible for those additional programs. Making sure that you are sending monthly requisitions to receive your key payments. Can't stress it enough. Remember um, that you guys ultimately are responsible for uploading your files and submitting them within 30 days. If it's after 30 days, it is considered state noncompliance now, but also timely requesting these key payments. If they transition to a housing choice voucher, Section 8, um, you're to enter that data into RCRS as well. 
so this is the key payment standard for properties coming online. A one bedroom is 520. A two bedroom is 620, and I'm not going to read them because I know you all can see. Again, remember, um, if you don't have any one bedrooms and a single person moves into a two bedroom, then it's automatically 25% unless DHHS indicates different. But again, make sure you're getting any waivers that are needed. <clears throat> the key payment standard uh, became effective January 1st, 2019. There have not been any other increases, and I don't know if that's even being discussed at this point. Okay, so yes, it is being discussed about a payment increase, but nothing has come down the line as of yet. One thing I will say, regardless of whether or not you get an increase for your property, that does not impact your targeted households. You're still going to get that key payment standard. If you go up $50, it doesn't impact your targeted households. And I will ask that you not send your targeted residents a copy telling them their rent's going up $50. Regardless of that you're giving it to other residents, it sometimes can cause major issues because they don't understand that it doesn't apply to them and they think their rent is going up $50. So just make sure that you understand regardless of what, whether you get your rents approved by NCHFA or not, that doesn't impact your targeted households that are receiving key assistance. So verifying uh, key rental assistance eligibility. Again, you, you've got to have your targeted letter of referral. Make sure that it's signed and completed. Look at the name making sure that it matches. And I just had this happen to me yesterday where the letter of referral spelled the name and it was missing a letter. So I looked at the RCRS system and it was correct. I looked at the application. So the referral letter had just, the person had accidentally dropped a letter off of that person's name. At the end of the day, could I have told probably who it was for? But so many people use different variances of names. If it doesn't match, send it back. I don't, I don't like sending files back myself, but if you guys catch this on the front end when they give you their driver's license and the name is different, go ahead and reach out to DHHS and say, this is the way their name is spelled on their driver's license, and this is how they spelled it on the application, which is the same, but doesn't match your letter of referral. They'll upload a corrected one. You never have to stop. You don't have to slow down. And you don't have to have your file sent back trying to collect that information. So try to be proactive in gathering this information. The household has to, again, have a minimum of $300 per month. They have to have a disability source, a minimum of $1. And that must be state or federal. Again, the household's income can exceed the 50% area median income, and the household size meets the required bedroom size standard. So on a monthly basis, you're required to log into RCRS and request your funds. There are um, a couple of different ways that you can request them. Um, at the top, a lot of people want to just do that rental assistance button at the top. It does not work. Um, and right now, it's not available. And I don't really, I hope that it's not available, and I'll tell you why. When you're requesting the funds for each individual property, you need to be looking at that to see, excuse me, if anything looks not right. You should be verifying the amounts. Also verifying, did did Mary Jane move out mid-month and I'm requesting the full amount of funds? You know, that is the only time that I will allow a paused payment. If Mary Jane moved out last month, you've requested the funds and it's got her name on there and you know she's not living there, pause it. Pause that payment. And then go in the system after you submit it and do the move out in RCRS. Once you do that, the system will automatically prorate whatever rents you're still owed, but you're not having to try to pay back monies. So try to look at each individual property that you're requesting payments from and make sure that those people that are listed there are actually still living on your property. 
Um, the request is approved weekly and it's submitted for payment every Wednesday, except today because I did it yesterday evening. Um, but normally I do those Tuesday evening making sure everything's been approved. Wednesday morning I get the requisition ready and it's sent to finance. You guys receive the funds the following week, knock on wood, as long as everything's working as intended. Um, there have been times in the past where the system had a cricket or I couldn't get something to work and it's, you know, not went out as timely, but we only re required to make sure you get, guys get your payments within 30 days of your request. But knock on some wood again, it's been doing like it's supposed to, and those go out weekly. Entering new move-ins into RCRS, you're gonna log into RCRS and pretty much follow these steps. Go to property list, select the property, click on buildings, um, and select the property, the appropriate building and unit number, and then add your unit event. You're gonna add all the information into RCRS. The key assistance and tenant rent is calculated automatically. The system does it based on the information that you enter into RCRS. So if you do your calculations and you look up and the stuff doesn't match, like say the rent is different or the information doesn't match what you've got on your documents, please stop and reach out. Because once you've uploaded the documents and you've entered it, if something's not adding up right, I'm more than happy to look at it with you. The first thing you need to look and see is, is the utility information, has it been, is it not there? Because sometimes when it's in the midst of being approved, the utility allowance won't show up in the system. Well, if there's no utility, the system automatically calculates at 30%. So that impacts the rent and subsidy amounts, right? Um, another thing that can impact it is, did you enter a one bedroom override? If you've got one person in a two bedroom unit, you have to click that one bedroom override. That tricks the system into charging them 25%, right? So make sure that you're entering all the information before you mark it complete, make sure the documents are there. If anything's not kosher with it, please feel free to reach out. These are move-in required documents. Um, the letter of referral, any waiver letters, the rental application, all the verification forms and file documentation, the tenant income cert, rent and calculation, uh, key calculation worksheet. If you have 100% home on your property, you'll have a home calculation worksheet. All pages of the lease, the key lease addendum, the supplemental information form, the le tax credit lease addendum, which again is required, and the home lease addendum if you have home funds. Make sure that all of the documents are uploaded for this move-in file. Before you move someone into your property, please make sure that you have everything you need. The other thing that I will say is, before you sign the documents with the resident, go back into VNR, go under that tenant's name, and see if any waivers were added. DHHS is supposed to upload transition waiver letters, bedroom waiver letters, whatever, when they upload the letter of referral. But sometimes they may not have all of the information and they might upload it a week after. If you guys don't go back in and check it, it may have been sitting there, you move them in, and then we've got an issue because um, we're trying to figure out how to fix it. So be due diligent, look at it, look in vacancy and referral before you sign that lease. With recertification, um, of course, you've got to have the questionnaire, all the verifications and documentation, just like with the move-in, the tick, the worksheet, um, again, home calculation worksheet, if you have 100% home on your property, and the key lease addendum. If a waiver is in the file, follow noted instructions. Again, if it's a bedroom waiver, it's gonna indicate on that letter that this should be uploaded annually. And again, if they need a waiver and you guys don't provide it to us, we will in the future be sending the file back to you. 
So tips for compliance with home income and assets. For properties with home funds, you are required to collect a minimum of two months of source documentation for income. Assets must be, thir must be third party verified and a disposed of asset form must be used. The under 5,000 form must not be used. Now, in some cases I see a straight tax credit property and for whatever reason, they've decided as a management company that they're gonna third party verify, but they still wanna use the under 5,000 form and not use the disposed of asset form or use all three. Um, remember, you're giving us conflicting information when you're doing all that. If you're verifying assets, use the disposed of asset form and those verifications and move on. You don't have to upload all three into the system. If you're using the under 5,000 form, that, that already has the question about the disposed of asset form. So you can use that one document if you only have tax credits. But again, if you have any home funds on your property and you're required to verify those assets, then use that disposed of asset form. If you don't have it, you can get one from the website, but it has a notary on the bottom of it. If you will email me, I have a copy without it. <laughs> It's not a requirement that it be notarized, but if the notary is on the bottom of it, it must be completed. Um, increase in household income. So annually, you guys know you're recertifying. The tenant income and rent share is calculated based on their new income amount. The resulting amount will be included in the lease and the key lease addendum. If the income increases above the 50% area median income, this does not impact their eligibility. The tenant's rent share just simply increases proportionate to the increase of their income. So they move in, you verify that they're at 50% or below, right? So they're good. Let's say two years down the road, they get another job and they're making above 50%. They are still a targeted household. Even if their income increases, you know, exponentially and they're getting social security and and they go way above and they're not even pay, getting receiving key assistance that person is a targeted household okay regardless so even if they're not getting key assistance they're still considered targeting because you know ultimately what can happen they can lose their jobs and we'll get to that in a minute there's an example um if the increase results in the tenant share exceeding the payments standard the property management will continue to calculate their share using the key formula until the household is at the standard rent associated with the targeting level for the particular unit. Now, what that means is, let's say that you have different set-asides on your property. Or, no, let, let me change that. All the units are at 60%. Um, the rent that you receive for the two bedroom unit is 620. The rent that you get from everyone else coming in is $900. You're gonna continue to calculate that tenant's rent until they get up to that 900. You don't go from 620, the resident exceeds that and you automatically take them to 900. That's not the way it works. You're going to take them up until they get to that set aside that you've got them in that unit for. So, and if you're not sure, reach out. So here's an example, one bedroom at 520. The property rent for a one bedroom is 650. You're gonna continue to use that key, calcu key calculation worksheet until you bring that household's rent up to the 650. Um, is this still considered a targeted household? Yes. The household is still targeted. If the household's income exceeds the payment standard, you're just going to change the assistance type over to no assistance and then enter the rent amount, upload your documents and submit the file. When you change that to no assistance, it's no longer going to go in my key files, but there's a, another blanket of uh, units that I look at that are non-key assistance units <laughs> and that will go back into that, that little folder. So it's looked at and we verify that you guys have calculated correctly and then the file is approved. 
again, you'll continue to use that until they get up to your payment standard. Now, at that point, you do not have to provide us continuously with all of the documents for the file. You will just continue to verify the information and enter it. If the household loses income, can they go back on the key program? Yes. So if the resident moves in, yes, ma'am. Yes. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to repeat a question in just a second, guys. We're just trying to get clear, clarity. That's right. Okay, and the question was if, if she had, say, a 70-unit property, but only 50 of them had assistance on that property, are they required or need to offer that availability to a targeted household? And Sandy was letting them know they needed to reach out to DHHS ultimately um, and let them make the decision because sometimes it can impact the amount that the tenant is going to pay. So you would let DHHS decide if it is in fact, the, the assistance is on the actual property itself, um, the, whether or not they would receive that assistance um, or whether they would stay on the key program or key assistance, sorry. Um, the household is still targeted and you continue to report any issues to DHHS. I'm going to say this again. If the, ha the household is still considered targeted and you're still going to continue to report any issues to DHHS. Lease violations, if the tenant doesn't pay their rent. Now, I'm not talking about subsidy. I'm not talking about the manager over here, Mary Jane, was three months late uploading her documents to me, so they're subsidy owed. I'm talking about the resident rent. If your policy states that rent is due on the 1st and late after the 5th and that resident didn't pay, you put a notice on their door just like you do everybody else. The only way that you're treating them different is that you are emailing a copy to DHHS, that Housing Stabilization Coordinator. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to do in letting them know about lease violations, late rent notices, 
if you file on the 15th, if your policy says we file eviction on the 16th of the month if you haven't paid, follow your policy. You let DHHS know on the 5th, file for eviction, send a copy, let DHHS know we have filed eviction on the 16th. You continue on just like you would anybody else. You're just letting them know. As long as you're doing that, we will reimburse you up to $1,000 for court cost as long as you're following the policies as it relates to DHHS and notifying them of any issues. Um, and this says failure to report household issues to DHHS does result in the loss of ability to make a special claim. So just make sure you understand that that is the one step that you're continuing. Anything that goes on that you have to send a notice to the resident, you're going to send one to DHHS as well. So if the household circumstances change, there's a decrease in income or a loss of employment you're going to complete a new um, update or a new recertification event. That's at the loss of an income. If the head of household is still receiving disability, they're eligible to return to key. If they're no longer receiving, you're going to reach out to DHHS for further guidance. So you're letting DHHS make the determination whether they can, are still eligible for that key assistance. Key payments. Yes, ma'am. Oh. I do. Okay. So we had a question come in, and I'm... Is it the first one when a household exceeds AM? Okay. So the question is, when a household exceeds AMI and no longer receiving key assistance, when we're raising the rents, is the increase driven by the 30% of annual household income or is the increase maximum perimeters used to determine what the increase is for the annual certification? I'm not sure what the 30%. I think she was referring to the most that a household can pay 30% of their income for rent under this program. No, there is no 30%. You're going to base it on their income based on the percentage that they pay. So um, regardless of the amount, whatever their letter says, if it's 25% or 20% or whatever, that's the percentage they're going to continue to pay based on that, the size unit or and or waiver letter that they've received um, until you get them to the rents that are associated with that unit and that set aside. I hope that answered the right the question right. Okay. Okay. So key payments. I don't know why everything's blurry for me today. I'm having issues. <laughs> um, all files receiving key assistance must be submitted within 30 days of the unit event. Files will be processed within 30 days of the receipt. Return files delay your process and start the clock over. Now, again, I mentioned earlier, you guys are required to get these unit events entered. I can't stress to you enough getting these things in timely because this can put the property and the management company not in good standing if you do not meet these requirements. And basically what that means is the management company is taken off the approved management list, which is negatively going to impact them, which can negatively impact y'all, especially site people, because um, if you're the one that is uploading the information, make sure that you're doing it timely. So here's an example. The moving occurs on 11-1. They have to be uploaded by 12-1. So that's 30 days, right? Um, recertifications should be started 120 days prior to the effective date. You guys, please, I can't stress this enough. Um, if it's 8-1, um, the paperwork should be started April 1st. In that, I would have my, because you guys know I worked on site, right? A long time ago, like so long ago. Um, 
but get your recertification documentation together. I always stress, look at your file, look at last year's file, so you kind of aware. Whether you have the resident come in and fill out the paperwork, you have to help or, you know, assist them, whether it be reading the questions or whatever. Um, make sure that you are still sending those notices. When you send the 120-day notice to the resident, whether it be to set up a time or with the paperwork, make a copy of it, email it to DHHS. If at 90 days they haven't returned it, you're reaching out to DHHS, right? You're sending them a copy of that notice. Um, management is required to annually recertify regardless of any requirements for the property. You know, some people say, well, we're only required to do the research and then we don't have to do it anymore. No, for your targeted key households, you annually recertify them. Um, again, make sure you're providing notices to the resident, but also to DHHS. And I, was, I had just started this and I remembered I had put it in the slides. So again, 120 days out, you're sending a copy to the resident, DHHS. What is your policy uh, for recertification? Do you give them the package? Do you assist them? Um, do you have a return by date on your recertification paperwork? Do you let them know you've got to have it in by this date? Um, provide a date and time to meet the resident. You know, again, it's up to the management company how you handle it, but just make sure that you get a standard procedure for yourself um, that you're handling this across the board, and that will help you remember to send these notices to those residents and to DHHS. At 90 days, did you receive everything? Are you able to process? If not, if you haven't gotten anything, again, send in a 90-day notice to the resident and a copy to DHHS. At 60 days, do you have everything completed? Are you ready to go? Um, can you finish this research? If not, you're giving a 60-day notice to the resident. We're getting close, aren't we? At 30 days, you're giving that resident a 30-day notice to vacate because they haven't provided you with what you need to recertify them. You're also sending a copy to DHHS. Has DHHS had ample time from 120 days out? They've known that you haven't been receiving what need, yeah, you haven't been receiving what you need. So they're not in the dark. You know that residents got notices. Now they've got a 30 day notice to vacate that unit, right? Uh, depending on your management company, depending on your policies. Can you work with them and maybe get it completed within 30 days? Is it the best scenario? Why not? What happens when we start trying to rush through things? We make mistakes, don't we? Whether it be in calculating incomes, missing stuff, missing documentation. Um, the biggest thing I see with late research is that the management forgets to either one, put in a one bedroom override, and they know they'll sit there and put 25% on that key calculation worksheet, but they'll enter as rent and subsidy what's in the system, and it's not right. So they didn't double check, and they just put the wrong numbers in there. So what happens? If you send me that file three months after the fact, what happens? The owners, the management company, that site, that property, you lose that money. Because if you calculated and you told the resident your rent's $160 when it should have been $200, you've got to give them 30-day notice of that increase. So those months that you didn't send it to me, you've lost them. You can't recoup that money. We're not going to let you go back. Now, having said that, if the tenant is late and delayed and you're sending the notices and you're letting DHHS know, and then last minute you're trying to get this stuff uploaded, provide a clarification statement. You know, we've been working with DHHS, blah, 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 blah. When I calculate it and, and there's an error and it's before, before the date that it's due, I'm going to send that file back and I'm going to say, you guys have done everything you can. Now, again, if you wait three months before you send it to me, no, I'm going to hold you responsible. But if you guys do what you're supposed to do, I'm going to hold that resident responsible, and they're going to have to pay that back rent because you did everything that you could to try to assist DHHS and that resident. So 
it matters that you guys are providing this documentation and that you're keeping a timeline of this stuff. So very, very important. Again, if a targeted household does not comply with your lease, proceed as you would with any other person following your company policy. Management must take one additional step, and that is sending a notice, sending a copy to DHHS. If you would evict anyone else for this, and, it, and your policy says we're going to give you three lease violation notices and then we're going to evict regardless, follow your policy. Because, again, you know, we want this to succeed, but we don't expect management to incur huge cost at the expense of the property or the management companies. Um, you know, we're here to try to help you um, and follow your policies because that's, you know, I can't stress it enough. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, you are eligible for these monies. My favorite topic, transfers. <laughs> um, so they're in the system now in RCRS. In the past, management companies did these files as a move out, move in, okay? Regardless of your funding sources because sometimes the way that people make selections on their 8609s they may have to they may treat each individual building as a property so on paperwork they may have to do it as a move out move in it doesn't matter how you're treating it we're treating it in RCRS as a transfer okay so you transfer out transfer in that's the way it's looked at this is now approved for the targeted households, targeting with key households, um, it is an approved process. When a transfer is completed, you now have ability to upload documentation. I'm sure you guys already know this. One thing I will say, the system does not recognize the transfer as a true event. In other words, it doesn't trigger a new recertification date. So two things, if you're treating it as a true recert, when they transfer because you're verifying information again you can immediately the next day do a research new recertification or if you're treating it as a move-in you're going to do it for that exact same day and list it as a recertification and you're going to upload the documents in that that way the system recognizes there's a new event that has happened and it's going to put the person in the right unit also, just so you know. Um, depending, again, on management company and how they require it to be handled, um, some management companies don't want it. They have a HUD mindset that if this person moved in on January 1st, it doesn't matter if they research them mid-year or if they move four times, their research is always going to be January 1st. So, again, it's your management company's decision whether or not how you're going to treat that um, as it relates to whether it be looked at as a full research or as just a true transfer. When you do the transfer out, transfer in, the transfer out stays in red until I approve the transfer in. The reason it stays red is because we had management companies doing it incorrectly and then they did move, immediately move someone into that unit and maybe not even click the unit event complete on the transfer in so it sat there for a few months but this file over here in the transfer out one got approved and at that point it's locked down so there were a lot of errors so this the way the system works now it keeps it red so you guys can't move anybody in until that transfer in is approved again if you have questions on it please feel free to reach out um, there is more detailed information in here about it and hopefully you'll fall under one of the other scenarios and can figure it out through this. Um, we already mentioned that the system doesn't really recognize the event, you know, the transfer. Um, if management's going to use the original move-in date, they upload all the documents into the transfer event. Make sure the income and everything is correct in the system and submit it. And then again, if management's gonna treat it as a new move-in, uh, the same thing, you're going to enter a second event, you're going to upload the documents. So scenario one, if management is treating 
this as a transfer only event, the key lease addendum will end with the previous recertification was due to end. So this is scenario one. The household moved in January 1st, 2018. A transfer was done 6-1-2021. The key lease addendum should reflect what the management company has decided. So it's going to end 12-31-2021 because they're planning on doing a research for this household January 1. So it's going to end in reference to that old unit. In this event, a second unit isn't created. If you're treating it as a research and move in, the household moves in January 1st, transfers complete 6-1-2021. The key lease addendum should reflect a new ending date of 5-31-2021. When you create that second event, you're going to list it as the same day as the transfer. This is the only time the system will allow two events on the same day. So if they're transferring in, you can make the research effective on the same day, upload the documents, and again, that, because you created, made it a true research or a new move in, it's going to end on 531 based on the effective date of this transfer. Again, if I've com totally confused you, I'm so sorry. Hopefully I have not. Um, look back over it. But if you have questions, ultimately, please reach out first. I'll be glad to walk you through it and explain it. Um, you know, reach out to your management company and ask them, how do we handle transfers? Do we allow them? Or do I have to technically consider to move out, move in? You find out from them because all I'm going to give you is the information on how to do it. I can't tell you what your management company's policies are. Yes, ma'am. To, in reference to transfers. We have a question. Give me just a second. Okay. So with the, um, they're asking, can you elaborate on how to date a key worksheet and a key lease addendum correctly? So depending on if your recertification date for this household, let's just say, is 6-1, okay, you guys are recertifying, the effective date on the uh, key calculation worksheet, you know it's going to be 6-1 of that year, right? With the key lease addendum, it's going to start on 6-1, and as you see on this one, it's going to end the next year, the day before, right? So it's going to end 5-31 of the next year. Now, why do I say that? Because a new one's going to be effective on June 1st of the next year, right? Because you're supposed to be re uh, recertifying annually. You recertify every year on 6-1. So it's only going to be good until 531. It dies at midnight that night and the new one goes into effect, right? Okay. Hopefully that answered your question, I hope. If not, please feel free to reach back out. <clears throat> Move-in files, what do I do? Y'all do see the chicken driving the truck, right? I'm sorry, I had to add that because I was like, yes. Um, so, a targeted applicant eligible for key assistance, this is a four-person household, is moving into a three-bedroom unit. What percentage would they pay? You got four persons moving in to a three-bedroom unit. We know, on, and on most properties, the utilities are paid by the tenant. So what would they pay? Three-bedroom, four persons. Do they meet the minimum requirement, minimum household size requirement? If you look across, you see three-bedroom. It says a minimum of four persons. So they qualify for that 15%, don't they? Is a bedroom size override needed in RCRS for this event? 
Nope. Correct. Thank you. When income and assets are listed in RCRS, should rent subsidy amounts match what is on your documents? Yeah. The information in RCRS should match what's on your documents. Scenario two, a targeted applicant eligible for key assistance, this is a one person household, is moving into a two bedroom unit. The property has one, two and three bedroom units. To calculate the rent and subsidy, blah, 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 one person household is moving into a two bedroom unit. Is a bedroom size waiver needed for this household? Yes. They don't meet the eligibility requirement, do they? Look in vacancy and referral before you reach out to see, because again, DHHS is pretty much on time getting you guys these letters. Um, not always, but most of the time now I see them entered in vacancy and referral. And when, sometimes when I'm returning the file, I say, it's in vacancy and referral, go pull it. <laughs> Upload it and then resubmit the file because it's got to go back through the list. Um, so make sure that you're looking, again, for that document. Is a bedroom size override needed in RCRS for this unit? Yes, more than likely it is. When income and assets are listed in RCRS, should the rent and subsidy amounts match what is on your documents? Yes. I do want to give you an example. I wanted to give it to you so that you could actually see it. When I talk about a one bedroom override, that's what I mean. Some people think, well, she said I got to do a one bedroom override, so I put two bedroom in there. No, that's a two bedroom override. <laughs> When I say you need to enter a one bedroom override, just as this indicates, number of bedroom override, one, that tricks the system and makes them charge 25%. If you did two bedroom, it's gonna charge 20%, which is what the original is for a two bedroom anyway. So just make sure that, again, if you have questions and it's not adding up right, reach out. I'll be glad to help you figure out what's going on but just try to make sure that you're looking at this information and entering it correctly so that when you guys submit it, I don't have to return it for this stuff. Because um, you guys get ill at me, and, yeah, we all get aggravated. Um, again, utility allowance, I mentioned this earlier, it does impact your rent and subsidy amounts if it's not listed and approved in RCRS. Um, and what I did is on my side, as you can see, under the details, excuse me, if you look, because I was trying to figure out, okay, why is this not calculating right based on my calculations? And then I realized if you look, you see the zero that circled in red, the utility allowance wasn't showing up for that unit. So I pulled up the details so you guys could see, if there's no UA in there, it automatically calculates at 30% because it thinks that the management company is paying the utilities. So that's the reason, again, it impacts your tenant rent and subsidy amounts. If it's not matching, look, if you've got a zero there, you know that there's an issue and UA is not showing up. Yes, ma'am. Your UA is not. Okay, does the ownership entity pay the utilities? You need to talk to Sandy here. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Teresa McSworley, and I will give you her email address when we get down. You know, and we'll help you get it figured out. Okay. Move-in recertification files. Once you have entered the household's information for your move-in or recertification, can't stress it enough, look at those calculations. Does the information in RCRS match what you have on your calculation worksheet? If it doesn't, again, determine, is a bedroom override needed? UA missing, what's going on? If all the information looks correct and it's still not showing up the same, please reach out. 
let's figure out what's going on. Sometimes numbers are transposed. I had someone send me a file. They entered the income at $175,000. Wrong. But, um, you know, sometimes it's just transposing numbers or entering things incorrectly. And sometimes we look at it so much till we just can't figure it out. And I'm the, I, I'll admit, sometimes I'm, I call Sandy, I'm, Sandy, will you please look at this file? <laughs> I can't figure out what's going on, but I'm exhausted, and I'm, I've looked at it ten times, and I just can't. And she's like, just step away. Peace in China, my friend. She keeps saying, peace in China. So I have to step back and, and go back to it when I kind of calm down. But um, if you guys are struggling, again, we're here to assist you. You know, we're partners. We all want to succeed. We all want to do well. Um, and we're definitely here for you guys. Returned files. Top 10 files, um, reasons files are returned. No documents were uploaded into RCRS uh, for the unit event. And this happens probably 10 times a week. I get a file submitted and it gets to the top of the list and I enter it and there's nothing there. You got the income listed, but no documents, um, nothing with the file. So it's sent back to you guys. Again, this starts it, the process back over because while we have 30 days to process, you go back to the bottom of the list when we return it to you. The data is entered in from, uh, incorrectly in RCRS, so it doesn't match up with your documents missing bedroom or income override information in RCRS. Calculation errors, management calculates incorrectly or misses income. Pages missing from a verification. I'm gonna stop right there. Um, if your document says page one of seven, I wanna see all seven pages. You can't send me one and, and, and expect me to approve the file. If your verifications, you know, if you guys are verifying, say, six months worth of checking account bank statements, you have to provide every page and you have to provide six months worth of statements. Um, you can't pick and choose and just do the front page of each statement. It has to be the full the full thing. Same thing with the um, Social Security verification. Um, I, I see it all the time. It'll say one of 13, and there'll be four pages in there. And I'm like, oh, no. So I have to return the file. So make sure if it says that there's 13 pages, that you have 13 pages. Sometimes they, cover, they count the cover letter as one page, but if they do, it'll be numbered at the top. So whatever your pages say, one of 13 or whatever, make sure that you can provide that number of pages. Security deposit amounts are incorrect on lease at move-in and research. If you guys require that your residents sign a full lease each year and not do a lease addendum, that's entirely up to you, you have to put the social, I mean, social security, the security deposit amount that the resident paid. Don't put zero. I know they didn't pay it this year, but you can put previously paid. But you need to enter the amount that the household paid. I see three hundred dollars stuck in there when the system pays it, and it's five twenty. They just stuck a random number in there. If you guys are making them sign a full lease provide the security deposit amount, and again, you can put previously collected at move-in or whatever you want to, but you need to address that uh, the security deposit. Don't put zero, because I'll send that file back. <laughs> Missing documents, failed to upload proper documents. In other words, you listed employment, but then there was no employment verification or pay stubs. Um, you just didn't document anything with it, um, but you listed it. Utility allowance. Uh, this is a biggie. Management not using the correct amount, using old amounts, or amounts that are not yet approved in RCRS. Um, the only time that is going to hugely impact anyone is when they're, again, the property is 100% home. But we still ask that you make sure that the amounts that you're using on your documents match what is in our system because that's the current approved amount. 
again, if it doesn't match, reach out to your management company or reach out to us. Missing or wrong effective dates on documentation and in RCRFs. Um, I had a, last week, a resident that had been recertified every year February 1st since he'd moved in. He recertified February 1st. And then it changed to August 1st. So they went from 2020 to 2021. Should have been done February 1st, 2021. They didn't do it until August 1st of 2021. The details and what it was, there was a late restart. The other documents indicated February 1st, but the system was indicating August 1st because that's I'm, I don't even know why. Honestly, I don't know why. So I had to reach out to the management company. Look at your dates. Recertification is required annually. If that happens and you recertify late, you can and probably will lose subsidies. Um, if the error is within, within the management company, again, if you've been in contact with DHHS and you're trying to recert and they're not signing documents, then we can usually kind of figure out what to do going forward. But again, you need to reach out, not just randomly. You finally got them to comply because DHHS got involved and you randomly stick 8-1 in there because the system isn't going to necessarily pay you for all those months from February to August. It's going to pick back up in August. So make sure that you're providing NCHFA notification so that we can tell you how to move forward. Wrong household information uploaded. If you guys submit a research and you've, and this is Sally, and Sally's lived there for 15 years, but you upload Michael's paperwork in it, you can unclick the box before, even if you like click unit event complete, if you automatically realize, oh, I put the wrong person's stuff in there, unclick the box and you can delete the documents. Once you submit it and I return it, those documents are there forever. You cannot delete those documents. So when a file has been submitted to us and we've had to return it, it locks down those documents and they're no longer able to be removed, just so you know. But if you catch it before it's processed, then you can remove those documents still. Loss of key payment. Um, and this was effective January of 2019, DHHS will no longer pay key subsidy for unit events that exceed 12 months. And we give you an example. January of 2022, for 14 months of key payments, the request came in from November to, of 2020 to December of 2021. The, company, the management company will not receive the payment for November or December of 2020 because those months are outside the 12 month window. This happens guys, I mean it does. And more than you would think, make sure that you guys are looking at your recertifications and I'm gonna give you a little cheat information, I shouldn't say cheat, but some information of where you can go in and look and know when your recerts are and try to you know keep up with things so that you're not going to lose subsidy payments is it can we can we take a break okay we're going to take a quick break um 15 minutes okay be back at 245 thank you okay welcome back um i'm going to go over some um, conflicts between home and key um, louise talked a little bit earlier about having to do the um home calculation worksheet if there was home at the property and doing income overrides and that sort of thing. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what the actual hiccup is with that. All right, the hiccup that we have with that is because the local, I can see with that, Lisa, is that why you're pointing to me? Oh, at this point, they know my sunglasses are on my head, but thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> okay, the problem with the rental assistance is that the HUD um, office determined that the key rental assistance was project-based assistance rather than operating subsidy. When the targeting program came out, we went to the local HUD office, 
you know, our properties have home funds, either from our agency or other agencies. Oh, no, no, this will be operating subsidy. This will be operating subsidy. And all of this impacted how you calculated gross rent. Life was great. You would not count the key subsidy when you're calculating the household's gross rent. Because if you do that, you know, you have to do adjusted gross income and all of that. Well, this would put the, um, the project-based rental assistance and the key rental assistance had to be added to the, tenants util and the, the tenant rent and the utility allowance to determine, um, to make sure that they were below the home rent, okay? Life was great. We weren't doing any of that. We we're moving right along. Everybody's happy. You're not having to calculate adjusted gross rent. We're good. A property in Durham has tax credits, but then they also have some home funds from another entity. Maybe it was the county or maybe it was the city. So they go in and monitor, and they cite that property for noncompliance because they are not calculating the home gross rent correctly because they're not including the key subsidy. So, of course, that property's upset. They reach out to us and said, you know, we've been doing this for years. This is what you told us to do, and now we've been cited for noncompliance. So we go back to the local HUD office. Okay, of course, by this time, people have retired. People are in different positions. Well, now we look at this differently. So in order to correct that, what we had to do was change the way that you calculated a household's income and calculated their rent. Hence, now you have to calculate adjusted gross income. All right, so here's an example of what that is. Of course, for those of you that work in the Section 8 world, you know what adjusted gross income is, and you know about giving deductions. If you have never worked in that world, or you don't have home on your property, you're, you should be thankful. Because I can remember the days of calculating adjusted gross income. People would show up at your office with all of their receipts for all of their medical expenses for the year. You know, this is back, you know, use brown paper bags, a little plastic bag, some food line. They show up with all their receipts, and you have to add them all together and figure out what their total medical expenses were, da 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 da, da. If you don't have home on your property, you don't have to worry about this. Those of you that do have home on your property, you are now calculating adjusted gross income, so you may or may not have that resident that shows up at your property with this bag of receipts. Of course, we're now in a time they can go to Walgreens, and Walgreens will give them a printout, nice printout, totals it for you, all of that good stuff. So for a person that's in a home 50% income limit bracket, the limit is 23600 Well, the low home rent is 644 Well, that household's income is 14446 All right, we're going to assume this household doesn't have any medical deductions, so 30% of that household's income would be 361 well, we know that the utility allowance on that property is $80. So the maximum that you can charge that household for rent is $281 because you have to take all of those things into account. So the tenant's rent that's calculated on the rent and subsidy um, calculation worksheet is 301. So if you charge that household 301, they would not be in compliance with home. That is what the um, representative from the local HUD office wrote them up for it's because they had not calculated it correctly. So now you guys are using the um, calculation worksheet, the home calculation worksheet, if you have that. I think there is even a copy of it in your book that you can use. All right, so rule number one, unless all of your units at your property are home, which is unlikely, but there are some properties, you cannot put one of your key households in a um, home unit. If the unit that you have come open, you've designated that as a home unit, you've got to swap that designation. That is why we say your home designations must float. So if you have a unit come open, you have to report it to DHHS as a vacancy. Don't designate it as a home unit. Don't put in there that it's a home unit because it's not. You cannot put a key person in a home unit. All right. If all of your units are in the property or home, you need to designate that unit as a low home unit and make sure that the household income is below the home 50% limit. Because if not, you're gonna be in non-compliance with home. So make sure that the person's income is below the home 50% limit. You disregard the tax credit 50% limit and the um, DHHS income waiver to meet this test. So if the household's income is 14,000 and the home 
50% income limit is 13,000, it does not matter that DHHS has given you a waiver. Their waiver is only applicable to how you calculate their rent. Their waiver does not waive compliance rules of the property. So make sure you're always below the 50% home limit, not don't take into account a waiver that they gave you for income or anything of that nature. All right, we talked about that um, income home rent and subsidy calculation worksheet. All right, and basically it reduces the rent collected from the tenant to 30% of their adjusted monthly income. All right, so you can't see on this screen here very clearly, but you can in your book because Louise included a copy of that in your book. So that is the worksheet that you fill out if you have somebody that's in a home unit, okay? If you have to put them in a home unit, you're going to do the front page of the key calculation worksheet, and this is the second page. Now, at the very bottom on this slide here, it's highlighted in yellow. Of course, in your book, it's probably just shaded because your book is not in color. It shows you the calculation that you have to do in order to determine what your income override is going to be in the system because the system is not going to properly calculate the rent and subsidy portion without this calculation. So you're going to calculate the tenant's monthly rent divided by the percentage on page one of the key calculation worksheet. Most of the time that's 25 percent, okay? And then you're going to multiply that by 12. That's going to be the income override that you need to put in the system so the system calculates the rent and subsidy correctly to put on your worksheets. Again, very few of you have to do this. A lot of times you do it one time and then you don't do it again until the next year and you've forgotten it all over again because you don't do it on a regular basis. We totally get that. If you have questions, reach out to myself or Louise and we can help you with that. The income calculation, the income override has to be done. If you don't, what you have on your papers is not going to match in RCRS. Make sure that you follow the equation at the bottom of the sheet there and you have to enter that in RCRS. Well, earlier Louise talked about the um, bedroom size override. Well, when you click the box that the um, property has an income, bedroom size, or payment standard override, it's going to drop down those three options. Well, in this case, you're looking at an um, income override. So in the box where it says income override amount, that's where you put that dollar amount. So essentially, you're telling the system, calculate the rent and subsidy over based on this amount, and then your numbers will be correct. Again, this is, if you don't, most of you don't do this a lot, but if you do and you need help, reach out to us and we can help you with it. One thing that we will say, even if you don't have home on your property, always check your calculations and make sure that they're correct. Get all your documents signed and dated. And some of you use this thing called true and correct. I'm late getting this filled out, or I'm late because they didn't come in, but we're going to write on this form. They're going to sign it today's date, which is the 9th, but we're going to add a little statement on there that says it was true and correct as of January the 1st. That means absolutely nothing to us. We don't pay any attention to that, other than the fact we tell them in training, why do they put that on there? That may do something for you internally. As far as we're concerned, that research is late and it did not get signed until today. So true and correct, use them all day long for your purposes, but if we see them on the documents, the date that's on it is the date that it was signed. We don't look at it as, oh, well, you know, they're going back to January the 1st. So make sure you check it. Double check your calculations. What is it carpenters say? Measure twice and cut once. Same thing, double check your calculations before you submit the stuff and everything should match. What's in RCRS needs to match what's on your papers. Some of the typical errors that we see, we talked about your calculations aren't correct. Um, some days we have better math than we do others. Double check it. Um, if you're supposed to enter an income or bedroom size override, you haven't done that. So your paperwork's right, but what's in RCRS isn't. So make sure you're entering that in RCRS. Sometimes you submit documents to us that aren't signed. Um, sometimes you don't upload the verifications, which we do need, and you are not uploading all pages. Your utility allowance isn't entered, or the one that's entered is not matching what's on your documents. So make sure that's correct. And then, of course, the rent and subsidy amounts in RCRS do not match. So 
All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about tenancy issues. This is everybody's favorite topic. This is the only thing that we ever talk about because we don't ever talk about the good tenants that pay their rent on time, you know, keep their apartment clean, you know, give us any issues, everything's great. There are several things that you need to do as it relates to tenancy issues, but the one thing that is consistent is you need to treat everyone the same as it relates to notifying them as that there is a problem. Louise talked about earlier, if somebody's rent's late, you would give me a late notice. If somebody in the targeting program's rent is late, you need to give them a notice. If they don't pay, file eviction on them. The only thing different that you're doing is you're reaching out to DHHS. We have some management companies that's kind of got into a system now. Maybe their late notices go out at the main office. So what they will do is they will go through there and they'll get a whole stack of all their late notices that people are targeted households. They scan an email or whatever they do to get them to DHHS all at one time. They don't have the person at the property do it, so it's a nice breakup you know, for DHHS. I'm sure DHHS would probably prefer that, but the properties are facing the same challenges that DHHS is. You know, they got limited resources for things that need to get done. Send them all to DHHS. They've got the late notice. That is their indication that they need to do something. Their rent is late. That is a problem. Then, if they don't pay their rent and it comes time to file eviction, you don't have to pick up the phone and call DHHS and say, you know, I'm getting ready to file a rent um, eviction. What are you going to do? They should know if they don't pay rent, you're going to file eviction on them. So, come the 10th, if they haven't paid their rent, on the 11th, you go to the courthouse or you reach out to your attorney and they do it for you, whose name gets included in the pot? The targeting household members get included in the eviction filings. You don't quote unquote work with them just because they're part of the targeting program. All right, yes, you want to be a good partner and you want to try to find out a way to help them, but you are not ultimately helping them or yourself if you don't file eviction on them or you don't give DHHS a notice. All right, so. If they are late paying their rent, file eviction if they haven't paid by the deadline. Now, if they haven't filed, if they haven't paid their rent and they come to the office and say to you, I've got trouble with my check from Social Security. Here's the paperwork. I've reached out to them. It's going to be in there next week. That's a different story than no communication at all. All right. So, again, t look at the situation. But if it's just like everybody else, they hadn't paid, they haven't reached out, file eviction on them. Make sure that you're keeping copies of what you send to DHHS. All of the emails. Make sure you keep that and that you've got it in writing because Louise is going to talk about special claims coming up and you've got to be able to document that you've notified DHHS. That's your proof in the pudding. Here's the emails that I sent Kay. Here's the emails I sent Wanda. Um, here's all the back and forth. The, you know, I faxed to them on the 12th. The papers, Monica got them, Angela got them. Make sure you're letting them know. Again, you're still letting them know, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but here's your chance. you got a few days to work on this. All right. That the first sign of a tenancy issue. Just because someone is not, if the issue is not related to rent or lease violation, doesn't mean you don't need to reach out to DHHS. If where you live at, maybe your neighbor gets out every single day and jog. So every morning when you leave to go to work, they're out there jogging. You're like, wow, good for them. You know, I'll see you when you get back type thing. If all of a sudden they're not there anymore, you don't see them every day, you think to yourself, I wonder what happened to them. Okay. Or if your neighbor lives next door or, you know, something happens and you, somebody you know every day you see them and you know they're doing the same thing every day and then all of a sudden they're not there. Maybe this person is the neighborhood Nozetta, and they come to the office and they keep you updated on everything that's happening. Whether it's happening or not, it's happening. You know, you know who moved out over the weekend, you know who had visitors, you know whose girlfriend was there, whose boyfriend was at somebody else's house, all these things that residents tell you, all right? Sometimes it's more information than you need to know. Well, all of a sudden, if this person stops coming up there to tell you, that is a reason to be alarmed, okay, or at least concerned. That does not mean that you should go down to their unit and bang on the door and just go in to see if everything's okay. No, you know, maybe they've gone on vacation. Maybe they've had a change of heart and said, you know what, she can figure this out on her own or they can deal with this. I'm going to just do something different. Pick up the phone, email DHHS and say, you know, I used to see this person every day religiously. 
all the time. I haven't seen it in a few days. Can you just have somebody check on them? Make sure everything's okay. That's a tenancy issue. Maybe it turns out they're on vacation, whatever what the issue is. But that's, a, that's an issue. You, I mean, you want to look out for each other. I would hope that if, you know, my mom lived at your community and you saw her all the time, you know, maybe you wouldn't go over there and bang on the door, but you'd go to the office and say, oh, hey, Wanda, you know, I hadn't seen Dale in a while. You know, know what's going on? Oh, yeah, she's gone on vacation. No harm, no foul. Let them know anytime there is a concern. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lease violation because if they can get on top of it at the front end, maybe it won't result in a lease violation. So it's very important that you communicate with them. What is in your lease as it talks about notice? Does your lease say that you will mail by U.S. mail notice to the resident? Hmm. Do you think posting that notice on their door meets that requirement? You know, that of course everybody that goes by there has got it off the door to see what it says and then stuck it back. If your lease says it needs to go by U.S. mail, make sure you're mailing that notice and you're not putting it on the door. Because any good attorney, the first thing they're going to say is, did you send this through the mail? No, they posted it on my door and all the neighbors know my business now. You haven't given them proper notice. So make sure what your lease says is what you're doing. Give a copy of it to the housing stabilization person. Send, you know, whoever that may be at the time. Let them know, hey, I gave this to the resident, but keeping you abreast of what's happening. Does your lease say that you have to give them three strikes or they don't get any strikes or if it's about a minor lease violation, we have to give them notice, but if it's a major, then I can go directly for eviction. Make sure you know what your lease says. Nobody wants to get to court and get embarrassed because they didn't follow their lease. And let me tell you something. In property management, whether you're part of the targeting program or not, your residents know more about the law and the legal aid than you do. Whether they, think, whether they do or not, they do, and they will use all of that to their advantage. So make sure you know what your lease says. How many notices do you have to require them before you can terminate? Can you give them one? You know, what's the situation? Also, what does your tenant selection policy say? Does your tenant selection policy say that you're going to do something extra? Make sure that you're doing that. Again, whatever your company policies are, make sure that's what you're following because ultimately, whoever you work for is the one that's signing your paycheck and living indoors is a great thing, especially when it's cold and it's raining and all that sort of thing. So please don't go back to your office and say, well, Louise said or Wanda said or Sandy said, we don't sign your paycheck and if you don't get one, as long as we keep doing a job pretty good, we're gonna to continue to live indoors and we'll have no clue that you're outside and it's cold. So reach out to us. You know, I think you said this in training. Is that what you said? Did I hear you correctly or whatever? Let your management company ultimately make the decision. For those of you that are here in the room, do any of you work on site? Do y'all get calls from a company called Social Serve? All right, some of you are shaking your head yes, and some of you are shaking your head no. All right, Social Serve is contracted between our agency and NCHFA, and what they're doing is they're calling the sites to kind of check on things and see if there's anything that they need to be aware of to let DHHS know ahead of the time, okay? Are they calling? Have you got any problems with your targeted households? Well, Sandy didn't pay her rent, or I had a issue, I had to call the police, or no, everything's great, you know, there's no problem. Answer the phone. If they leave a message, call them back. Let them know what your issues are. That is a way to hopefully get ahead of any issues that, that you may be having. If you don't call them back and they leave you a message, they put that on their report that they give to 25 people. And then we have to look up and say, well, why didn't you call them back? Or I always call on Tuesdays and they never answer. Well, we go into RCRS and say, well, they don't work on Tuesdays at that office, so they're probably not ever going to answer the phone on Tuesdays. But we tell them what your office hours are, but then we immediately call the site and say, you probably should be calling them back. Because if you don't, after so many times, they reach out to us and say, well, they're not calling us back. Reach out to them now. That does not take the place of you reaching out to DHHS whenever you have issues. You can't say, well, I told that person from social service that worries me to death that calls me all the time. They knew it. Well, that, there's probably a lot of truth in all of the above, okay, because they can be persistent, but that's what they're doing. They're supposed to do, and they're trying to help you out. 
let DHHS know. But be responsive to their calls, call them back, let them know what's going on because that is there to help you. We talked about make sure you call back. Um, again, if you don't respond when they send us that list, one of the things that we have to do is call Louise. Why are you not answering the call or why are you not calling? Well, I don't know who they are. And sometimes it will come up on the caller ID, social serve. Immediately people think social services is calling them and the last thing they want to do is get tangled up with them. Okay, I'm not getting involved with that. I don't want to be in, no, I'm not answering the phone. I'll let that go to voicemail. Well, just because it comes up social serve on the caller ID, that's not social services. It's probably them doing the um, call to get some information to make your life easier. So answer the phone, it's two or three minutes, the same, they're going to ask you the same question every month. So when, they, when you pick up the phone, maybe I think one of the ladies' name is Betsy that does the calls. Hey, Betsy, it's Sandy again. I know it's you. Everything's great. You know, you kind of get a chuckle out of it or whatever, but that's the, they're asking you the same thing every month. They don't change the questions unless they change or decide to change it for everybody. So it is this, usually the same person working the same area that's calling. Okay, Louise, again, I did not bring my phone. So do we have any questions on what we've talked about since we came back? The internet was kind of slow in here earlier, so. Okay, so we don't have any questions in this section, so Louise is gonna come up now and talk about um, special claims. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about special claims. Um, I know that Sandy d did the spiel before, um, but this says, remember me, what do I do? So these are the questions. Let's say that you've had to evict, the residents abandon the unit, or for whatever reason, um, they're gone. You're going to kind of ask these questions. Did I notify the housing stabilization coordinator regarding any tenancy issues I had? If you did, if he followed the procedures, the policies that are in place, then you can do special claims. Did I provide recertification notices, violations, correspondence that related to this household to that housing stabilization coordinator? Um, and the other question is, did I give DHHS the opportunity to salvage this tenancy? And pretty much I ask, that's what I ask DHHS when I'm submitting one of the special claims that are provided to us, I ask DHHS that very que question, did management give you the opportunity to salvage this tenancy? All that's asking is, did you guys send them notices lease violations or any other correspondence that you had with the resident, did they get a copy? They look back into their folder and they say, yes, they did. If you did, then we can move forward with a special claim, they'll approve it, and you guys can get the monies. Now, damage reimbursement um, minus any security deposit at a rate of 75% of uh, claim total, the maximum you can re receive for damage reimbursement is $2,500. Reimbursement of any uncollected tenant portion of rent, again, that's tenant portion, during the period of occupancy, less any security deposits that's left, but it cannot exceed three months of the tenant portion of rent. Tenant portion of rent. So if the rent, tenant's rent is $200 a month and they didn't pay rent, for three months, you can request in this special claims up to those three months plus late fees, and I'll show you that in a little while, um, in this slot. 
And that is the reason that we stress so much you guys following the policy. I know that in 2020 and part of 2021, you guys could not file eviction or there was a moratorium and you guys, you know, the, the place, they were shut down basically um, and wouldn't allow eviction. But that is no longer the case unless something else has changed recently. But you guys have the ability to recoup up to, you know, $1,000 in a loss for eviction. Reimbursement of full payment standard for the rent obligation during the remaining lease period if the tenant abandons the unit. Now, that's two, not to exceed two full months of rent, again, minus any security deposits if, it, if there were any left. Um, that is the full payment standard. Now, that doesn't mean if the tenant passes away, you can get abandonment. <laughs> um, that's a different scenario. But if the resident leaves town at night, leaves the unit, abandons it, they're in a 12-month lease, you guys can recoup two months' worth of um rents and that's the full portion and again reimbursement for a successful eviction when following the guidelines these eviction costs may not exceed a thousand dollars having said that in normal instances your eviction is not going to exceed a thousand dollars we have seen a few cases where it has but um, very few so again as long as you're following your policies you guys should be okay Required documents when you're submitting a special claim. A completed special claims worksheet. Supporting documentation. And I'm talking about invoices, eviction papers. Um, you know, if you had to buy new carpet for the unit and the carpet was new when the person moved in, you know, you're going to show me where the carpet was replaced, the cost of that, et cetera. The security deposit d disposition, that's showing where um, you guys gave them a bill and broke down the security deposit and um, probably kept most of it or all of it. Um, tenant ledger, that's showing the rents that the resident pays and subsidy. And then the tenant lease. Those documents are required to be uploaded. So unpaid tenant damages plus unpaid tenant portion of rent equals total deductions from the security deposit and it says check your cl calculations so again if and we will look at a special claim in just a few minutes but you are initially deducting any monies owed to the property from that security deposit first and then whatever's left owing you'll do on a special claim So how do you do it? And I've basically kind of went through the system so that you guys could see where you would, um, number one, get the worksheet from. And up at property menu, you'll go down to special claim. And you can see over on the right-hand side where you download the worksheet. Um, and then it once you download it this will be included add a special claim when you click that you're going to have the ability to put the building number the unit number the move-in date should automatically generate because it's already in rcrs and then you're going to list any unpaid <coughs> amounts minus the security deposit that you're entering on that special claim once you get the information entered you click OK and then you can start uploading documents when you click documents it'll give you document types you can put in descriptions and then you can upload those documents once you get what you want uploaded you click done and then off to the right again you see that blue button that you can actually submit that claim when your claim is submitted it goes into another workflow because we have 500 um, called special claims and 
once your request comes in, we're going to look at it. We're going to check your calculations. Um, and look at it. If there are errors, we're going to let you know. If you haven't prorated, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, we're going to let you know. Payment that you receive for this once it's approved is one lump sum payment. It's not broken down by damages or unpaid rent, etc. You just get one lump sum. And it's pretty much when you request the rents each month, it's going to be attached to that. So when you make your request, you'll be looking for it. Um, we don't call you and tell you your special claim got approved. You will be uh, notified if it gets denied, uh, but I don't reach out if it's been approved. So the top six mistakes on special claims. All required documents haven't been uploaded um, in RCRS. Forms aren't completed correctly or um, calculation errors. The request submitted prior to a new move-in reported in RCRS. If you are requesting like abandonment cost or um, I think that's the only one. I'm trying to remember. Sorry, guys. Um, you can't immediately request a special claims and ask for those monies if the time frame is not passed yet. So in other words, if this person left today and you went ahead next week and did a special claim and wanted to collect those two months of abandonment, we can't pay you because those two months aren't up yet. If you re-rent it, then you're not due that money. So the time lapse for those months has to lapse before you could actually claim something like that. Requests submitted prior to the end. Oh, well, I just said that. The vacancy loss. Um, charging resident for items that the property did not actually incur an expense for. Um, and so you may look at your carpet when you're doing up your stuff and you say, oh, this carpet's got to be replaced. And then your maintenance guy comes in and he says, well, you know, our cleaning guys, they might can get that clean. So the cleaning company goes in and cleans the carpet, and it's $100. I don't know what it is, but let's say $100. And so you can't prorate carpet that you didn't buy. Um, and when we talk about prorate, we're talking about the life expectancy of something. Your management company should have some policy in place that says, you know, as far as painting, we expect to paint every five to seven years. I don't know. Let's just say five. Um, we're going to change out the carpet every 10 years and appliances every 20 years. Now, you move someone in, you just painted the unit, and three months later, you have to evict them for non-payment of rent. And the unit, you've got to repaint it, the whole thing, right? You're eligible f for that repaint. But if they've been there for 10 years and you guys got to paint, and I'm just talking about paint, then you're not eligible because you are ex you expected to have to paint that unit after seven, right? Now, again, if the carpet was new when the resident moved in and he lived there six months and the carpet is damaged and it's tr trashed or whatever and you guys have to replace it, you can get the cost of replacement up to 75%. But let's say he lived there five years. At that point, that's what we talk about prorating. So we know carpet should last 10 years or 20, whatever. Um, let's say 10, and it was $1,000, and he lived there three years. There should have been seven years left on that carpet. At $100, you know, if it was $1,000, you would be eligible for $700 of that money, right? So that's what I mean when I say prorate. If they moved in and they were only there three months and you had to repaint the whole unit, then, you know, yes, you're eligible for 100% of it, well, 75% based on the rules, but you don't have to prorate. But if they live there for two years and the life expectancy is five, then you're only eligible for three years of that five years. So those things have to be prorated. Um, the only thing I, the, <laughs> the craziest thing, <laughs> 
Um, I saw a refrigerator leave one time. A refrigerator was taken out of a unit. It was a handicapped refrigerator, and um, which is a very expensive refrigerator. And they had not lived there long, and the refrigerator was pretty new. So, you know, that was a huge expense. Again, they only got 75% back on it, but they also got reimbursed for other things also that normally you wouldn't be eligible for. But, I mean, we know that things happen. Again, that's the reason we stress so much that you guys, it's important that you try to recoup these losses. Do we have any questions, Sandy? Nothing. Okay. So now we're going to do a case study. And I'm going to give you guys about 10 or 15 minutes to do this. Betty Boo, <laughs> a targeted program participant, moved into your property on 11-30-2020. She moved into a two-bedroom unit. There was a $620 security deposit paid on, on her behalf. Her tenancy was terminated, and you notice that, terminated. The lockout due to eviction was on 5-29-2021. Using the documents provided, complete the special claims form for this household. So if you guys will take a couple of minutes and just look at it, hopefully you can understand the ledger card. Um, it kind of goes from bottom to top, I believe. I can't remember. Um, as it relates to, like, the security deposit, it was kind of adding on as it went. But um, hopefully y'all won't have any questions. I didn't do a whole lot with it. I did an invoice um, for painting and stuff and um, something else. But if you'll take just a few minutes and complete that, and then we'll go over it.
All right, just a couple more minutes, about two more minutes, please. Okay, hopefully we had enough time um, to kind of get it together. Um, hopefully it was somewhat easy to follow. So at the very top of your special claim worksheet, you should have listed the amount that, of the security deposit that was collected on behalf of the resident, which was 620. Hopefully you had that up there at the top. Um, and then in the second part, the reimbursement for unpaid tenant damages, you would list um, the items that you had to do. Cleaning the unit, trash removal was 300. Repair and patch walls um, two times with kilts before painting due to smoke and damages. I ask that you guys make comments in there so I understand, you know, where you're getting your amounts from. Um, again, if it were something that was prorated, I would like you guys either on the invoice itself or on this document to show how you prorated. But in this case, they weren't there long enough, so it was 450 That total was $750. Again, at that point, remember... You're times in it by 75% based on the worksheet, right? So A, total cost from above times 75%. I came up with 652.50. Hopefully we all came up with the same thing. Um, you're going to subtract the security deposit from that, $620. That left a remaining unpaid damage amount of negative Fifty-seven fifty. Do you see how I wrote that? Because it's not a positive number, right? They had six twenty. We we took off five hundred and sixty-two fifty off of it, so that would have left us with the fifty-seven fifty. So in D, you're putting zero because you're not eligible for any anything above that. You you still got fifty-seven fifty in credit. Reimbursement of unpaid tenant portion of rent. There was two months of rent, which was $199 a month, plus two late fees. You see, I added that there. Now, let me explain to you why. We do say that you cannot exceed three months worth of rent payment, but I'm going to also say plus late fees. If you add the late fees at the top, you're only eligible for 75% of that. The late fees are due to rent, so we allow you to include that in the rent amount. However, and you're going to see this in the back of the book also, just so you know, you'll see how I broke it down off to the side. That's the way I like to see it, because if I can't figure out where you got your figures from, i got to return it. I have to be able to justify. Now, if you provide me the rent ledger card, and it's very clear and I can see it, then we're okay. But sometimes things aren't done. You know, there's a lot of different additions and subtractions and after the fact, and it's a little hard to follow. So make sure that you're giving me this information so that I can look at the rent ledger card and figure out what's going on. Okay? So that was $418.
minus the 5750 so you were eligible for $360.50. Now, the system doesn't allow you to do change. So when you enter it in line D for unpaid tenant portion of rent, you're going to round up to 361. Okay? Now, this person didn't abandon the unit. You had to evict them, right? So you're not eligible for anything under tenancy abandonment. So you're going to add your zeros, and we're going to move on from that. At the bottom of the sheet, eviction must be listed, and what you're going to do is write it in. The agency is working on the special claim form, and they're adding it to the bottom. It just it hasn't been added to the new forms. So just know that that's coming. It's not there yet. So you physically have to write that in. And I just tell people, you know, at the very bottom, just write out eviction and put the cost down. You're providing with the document, me with the documentation, you know, that you had to file for eviction. The total eviction cost was $230. And that's what you're eligible for. Remember, uh, the eligibility is up to $1,000. So I'm going to break it down real quick, and it's all on one sheet. Again, it's in the back of your book um, for you guys to kind of look at. The security deposit was six twenty. You, uh, the total cost was five six five sixty two fifty. That gave you a, a credit balance somewhat of fifty seven fifty, and then you subtracted the rent from that, and you got three hundred and sixty one dollars. Um, for reimbursement of unpaid tenant rent, nothing for vacancy loss, right? And eviction cost was $230. So the total amount for all of this that management can recoup, the five ninety one, dollars um, and then six twenty, dollars which was the security deposit. So in total, for the damages and stuff that you had, you got $1,211 because you're reimbursing yourself the security deposit and you got an additional $591. Everybody good with that? And hopefully I didn't do the wrong calculations. <laughs> if I had calculation errors, email me, but don't call me out on it. Um, <coughs> let's see. Yeah, no, okay, we're good. So special claims prorating expenses. We talked about this, that most items have a predictable life span. Management should have policies and procedures in place to define those life expectancy of major items, carpet, vinyl, appliances, cabinets. Um, again, if it's above normal wear and tear, you guys are eligible to recoup some of your losses and you can charge it against the resident security deposits. Examples of normal wear and tear, carpet faded or worn thin from walking. <clears throat> now, if they've only been there for three months and the carpet was brand new when they moved in and it's worn thin or there's damages and there's holes, that's not normal, is it? No. Um, nail holes or pinholes in the walls. If they're, people are going to hang pictures. I'm sure you guys hang photos in your home. You know, we don't expect you to charge them because they've put little pinholes in the wall to hang pictures. Fading, peeling, or cracked paint, that's kind of on you guys. Obviously, it sounds like there was issues if it's just fading or peeling. Um, tenant damage is like you're having markings on the walls, um, missing fixtures, holes, stains, or burns in the carpet, gaping holes in the walls or plaster. Um, I went into a unit doing physical inspections, and there was a hole through the wall to the other room, pretty much the size of a body. And the gentleman that was renting the apartment and his brother got into an argument, <laughs> and he pushed him through the wall. Um, that is damage, right? 
that he's he's he is he is as a matter of fact i would charge him for that and make him start making payments on it again you guys if you have residents in house and there are damages i think wanted to mention that earlier you guys can you know if you have to fix something or whatever you can do an, an agreement with that household there is a limit to what you can charge them monthly because we all know they're on a fixed income and a lot of them have well it was 794 what is it now 814 or 841 you know a lot of them are getting the minimum social security amount <coughs> they can't afford to pay two hundred dollars a month to, to reimburse you sometimes fifty dollars can impact them eating groceries or not i mean you guys for real it is we have residents out there that truly are trying, truly have a disability, and they struggle. And so we need to be aware and understand that while we want to assist them, of course, we, you know, you still got to follow your policies and procedures. But there are, again, limits as to what you can charge. And if you don't know what those are, you need to look in the targeting program manual. If it's not specified there, reach out to DHHS or NCHFA, and we can let you know what we kind of ask that you do as far as payment plans and so forth based on what their income is. Um, this is a HUD sample chart <clears throat> of um, what the predictable lifespan is of things. Again, this is HUD, and we don't require that you follow this, but this kind of gives an example like refrigerators, the life expectancy is 10 years. Now, carpeting is five years. That's what they say the predictable lifespan is. Let me just say this. My carpet better last more than five years. I expect it to. I'm sorry. I don't agree with five years on carpets. So again, it's the management policy. This just kind of gives you a sample chart of how HUD um, looks at things. But my carpet better lasts more than five years. Amen. So interior paints, you see they've got three to five years. Um, tiles and linoleum, five, seven years. And that's with family or elderly. Window shades, screens, and blinds. Um, Sometimes when management companies do physical inspections and they see that blinds are damaged, they will replace them and charge it back to the tenant, and that's fine. Make sure that you are having them sign something and that you are providing documentation of the cost of that. Um, you know, some of them ask, can I go get the $5 Walmart ones that, you know, and we get that that's cheaper, but you guys usually have an assigned type of mini blinds or whatever that you buy from because they're all consistent. You want them all to look the same. We get it. Um, but just make sure that, you know, when you provide that with them, you show them the receipt of their the cost that you had um, so that they understand. They know they damaged it. We know that. But if you're going to charge them for that, you need to make sure that you're letting them see that it's not, that you're not buying Walmart for $5 and charging them 40 right? Just make sure that they understand. Um, again, prorating, if the carpets were new when the resident moved in, then you can list the whole 100% of the cost of the carpet. Of course, you're going to get 75%. Um, if the resident lived there for three years, again, we're prorating <clears throat> based on the life experience expectancy of the carpet in the scenario we see there was five years Recar the carpet replacement was twenty five hundred dollars if you divide that by five years it's five hundred and you're only eligible for two more years that's a thousand dollars so the resident could be charged a thousand dollars toward the carpet replacement but again management must have documentation of the actual replacement cost does anybody have any questions on that We're getting into short rows. No. You guys are awesome. I wish you'd ask questions. <laughs> Liven me up here. Um, security deposits. Um, DHHS pays the security deposit for all key households that became effective 5-1-2014. Uh, 
the system automatically generates this payment. Security deposits are sent to the same account as all other payments that you receive. Management has to ensure that this money is transferred to the applicable escrow account as required by the real estate law, North Carolina real estate law. Security deposits are equal to one month payment standard regardless of your typical security deposit. Again, this is key households. Security deposits are applied to any balances owed by the resident, if applicable, and remaining amount would be refunded to the resident. So if someone moves in and they live there for two years and they do absolutely no damage, and when you go in the unit, you don't even have to clean the carpets, nothing's wrong, it's perfect, and the monies are going to be reimbursed, they would be reimbursed to the resident. You would send that money to the resident. Um, yes? Key is going to pay their payment standard. So if you have a targeted key household, you know that our payment standard is 520 for a one bedroom. The system generates a 520 security deposit, regardless of what your amount is normally. Now that's again for targeted key, if, they get, if they're getting key assistance. Um, the amount of security deposit on the lease, lease has to be the amount of the payment standard or we will return for corrections. If a ha this is a biggie, everybody listen, wake up. If a household transfers units, you are to contact NCHFA prior to the transfer to ensure your security deposit is handled correctly. Let me tell you why. Just because Mary wants to transfer units, she just randomly decides that she wants to be in a different unit. Do you have to allow her to transfer? You know, what's your policies? I don't know. Now, again, if there are issues or it's a reasonable accommodation request, whatever, if you guys are going to allow them to transfer, you need to understand that security deposit follows that tenant to that new unit. You cannot put charges against that initial security deposit, and you don't get another one, okay? So if you lease violate, if you go into that unit and you're doing physical inspections, and you do a lease violation on that household, and then two weeks later they come up and say they want to transfer. Two things I would do. Number one, I'd reach out to DHHS and let them know that they failed inspections. You've given them a lease violation because they've already got it. You let them know. And now they've come up and requested a new unit. Um, you know, those damages in that initial unit have to be, you guys have to have a, the ability to recoup. But you need to make sure, reaching out again to DHHS, you know, you need to let them know, and then they can kind of tell you how you guys can maneuver through this transfer. Um, now, if you've given them three or four lease violation notices and you file for eviction and they request a transfer, you know, I mean, and it happens, you know, just be reaching out, letting DHHS know, you know, stay in contact. But I wanted everybody to be aware that security deposit follows that resident. You know, you can't use that to recoup losses from that initial unit. So just be very careful and make sure that DHHS is aware that that unit is damaged and that they have gotten lease violation notices. So security deposits for non-key households. DHHS will pay the security deposit for the non-key households. This was effective 12-1-2016. The deposit amount is the amount charged by management or the current payment standard, whichever is lower. The lease and targeting referral letter have to be uploaded into the system. And again, this is processed through RCRS. If a household transfers unit, uh, units, again, you need to reach out to NCHFA to make sure that that security deposit is handled correctly. If you have properties that don't have key assistance, you'll see this, that non-key assistance button, 
And when you click that, you're going to create a new payment just like you do in the other system, but it's for non-key. And the household, the security deposit is going to show up. And then you're just going to click submit. So one thing I will tell you, if your property has rural development and rural, rural development um, gave you um, notice that you guys should only be across the board or you requested and got approved for a $200 security deposit across the board for your households, if you're charging everybody else $200, $200 is what you're going to get from us because that's less than the 520. Now, if it's a Section 8 property that has project-based rental assistance, it is the TTP. Again, if the TTP um, exceeds the payment standard, then it would be, which it should never happen, but it could, I guess, um, then you would only get up to that payment standard. But you know what I'm talking about. So the TTP is the tenant rent and utility allowance amounts uh, for a project-based rental assistance property. Yes, ma'am. Transfer fees, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, transfer, okay, so someone asked me, um, do we assist with transfer fees for households? And transfer fees are not allowed, are they? Yeah, so um, transfer fees are not allowed within the tax credit. We'll talk about that later. But um, so, no, um, we will not assist with transfer fees, and you don't charge transfer fees anyway. <laughs> so, um, We'll talk after class. Life is good. So with this example, you see that the security deposit was $197. Um, and so when they make that request, when they submit it, it goes into another workflow because we have 500. Um, and we approve this for payment, make sure everything's there. We're looking at the lease to make sure it's the correct amount. And we're making sure your calculations were correct. As you see, this one's 197. I'm pretty sure that was a Section 8 property with project-based rental assistance, so it was the TTP. Does anybody, was there any more questions? So we're going to roll right on. Okay. Hold fees. Whew. Wanda, don't hide your face because I say hold fees. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so hold fees. Hold fees are available for units that are held by DHHS longer, for, longer than 30 days. Let me say that again. Hold fees are available for units held by DHHS longer than 30 days. Now, I'm not talking about the initial lease up of a property. If you've got a new property, DHHS has those units for longer than that. Now, let's just say that you guys are working with DHS, DHHS, you have processed a file, everything's good, you're processed, you've got them ready for move in, but they can't move yet, whether it be because they're in rehab or there's issues getting someone to help them move. If it exceeds that 30 days, you guys can reach out and say, we want you to release this unit, and DHHS is going to say, we're going to pay you a hold fee for... 10, whatever days it is, it may be 30, um, and you guys will negotiate an amount. And I don't get involved in that, um, but I, you know, it is available if it exceeds that 30 days. Now, having said that, if you guys are the ones that caused issues and didn't move fast enough with the file, and it's 25 days, and then you send them a message to say, we're denying you for blah, 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 they still have those days to respond back. You guys still have to hold that unit until um, they have a chance to appeal. If they do an appeal, you cannot re-rent that unit. You're holding it on your time then. But if it exceeds 30 days and they've asked you to hold it longer, you can request a hold fee for that unit. Um, once you guys... Uh, receive a hold fee, make sure that you're submitting the um, requisition that they provide you 
in a timely manner, get it uploaded and request payments for it. And I'm going to show you a quick little way to do this. So under, again, property menu for that property at the bottom, it has hold fees listed. Over to the right, you'll see the green button that says add a hold fee. You're going to enter that information here. You're going to put the building and the unit number that you're holding for this household. <coughs> Sorry. The hold fee amount and the hold start and end date. Now, this one is 8-31-2021. If on 8-30 they call you and say, this resident is not ready to move, and it may be another 15 to 20 days, you guys have the opportunity to ask for another hold fee. You do not have to continue to hold. Um, you have the ability to ask for payment for that unit until they get someone moved into it. Once you get the information entered, tag on. Y'all see that applicant name? Wheezy Gardner. That's me. Just so you know. <laughs> I just realized I did that. Okay. So I moved myself into that hold fee slot. Um, and once you get everything entered, you're going to click Submit. And then once you request payments for the property, it will automatically generate. You do upload documents, that document that is signed by um, DHHS with this. Okay. We have one little piece left that we're going to talk about real quick. Targeted resident households. And you see I used Minnie and Mickey because I love them. And it says, let's do a search. And she says, in vacancy and referral, question mark. So we're looking for, we're going to go up to the top. You see where it says property search. And you're going to click on that. When you do that, it's going to bring up the property names that you have. You're going to select on the one that you're searching for. I had to box it out because I don't want y'all seeing all the little names. So the property name comes up and you hit search. And it's going to show that property and it's going to say view. When you click on that button, it is going to give you a list of your targeted tenants for that property. Okay? It's going to show you the date that they moved in and their research date. Did you guys know that was there? Ta-da! She said yes. Dig on it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. So that's a quick way, if you're not sure, um, as it relates to targeted households and you're going to a property if you're a regional and you're not sure, you can go there and pull it up and see who your targeted households are. And you see with this one, the um, assistance type is listed as key assistance. There is one that has a Section 8 voucher. Um, now that is because and I don't think it talks back to the system because this is in vacancy and referral again. So when this person got referred, they were they actually had a voucher when they were referred to the property. Um, your your list is usually going to say key assistance or whatever assistance they started out with on this list. And then it says targeted residents. How about like this? And we say in RCRS, sure. So we're going to click the APN number. And again, I'm sorry I had to block them out, so I know that looks a little weird. Um, the property name would be listed there. You're going to go to property menu and collect, select, excuse me, property activity report. You're going to print or click current project status. And then you're going to click Generate the Report. And this provides a report that lists all of your residents, any activities that you've done. You can see where the last cert date um, 
And you see that I highlighted the one that shows key assistance, um, DHHS, yes. Um, and if you look, it was a January 1, 2021 is the last event that was submitted in this. Is that, is that good? If it was January 1, 2021 was the last event done? They're late, ain't they? We had a research. Good thing you can't see the names on this. Okay. So, um, you can use this to highlight for your research. Um, a lot of, I'm not going to say a lot, a few of the management companies that I've dealt with, they actually print one off for each site and highlight based on um, when the research are due for the tent, the residents, so that the management company or the man site manager can keep up with it. Um, I only did the targeted and the key, but you'll notice I did uh, a few in green, and I am going to have to put my glasses back on. Um, so the very first one, you see that the last event date was 4-1-2021, so technically they're still okay. They should be working on it, right? but they're still okay with that one. Same thing for the one below it that's marked in green. I know you guys' sheets don't show green, but the second highlighted one, it's a three bedroom. Um, so the research was done 4-1-2021. The next one should be uploaded. I'm gonna be honest with you, it is February and I'm already getting May research uploaded to me. So. Think about that. May 2022 research are already being provided to me. If there's an issue with that file, they've got plenty of time to fix it, get the resident to sign it, and they're never going to stop receiving subsidy. We can fix it, and they've still got plenty of time, right? It is so important for you guys to start early, 120 days out, I'm just telling you. The very next one below it that is um, probably grayed out some is also key assistance. Do you see the date on that one? 12-3-2020. Are they a little late? Have they lost subsidy? Absolutely they have. So remember, again, looking at this, and I'm just trying to call your attention that there's ways that you guys can look in this like this. This is a quick review. It shows you that, yes, it's a targeted household. Yes, you're getting key assistance. When was the last research done? You can mark it. You know, it's a way to keep up with it. I'm just giving you ideas or hopefully giving you some ideas. And then the very bottom one is also highlighted. The last event in that unit was 1121 also. So that one is late also, isn't it? And since it's February and it was due January 1, they're over 30 days. So they technically are going to be considered in state noncompliance. Um, if this, sometimes they get by me a little bit. Like if you have one, you know, that's a little late, like say I don't get it until February the 2nd and it's a 1-1, okay. But if you have four files that you've submitted to me and they're one, two, three, six months late, and there's four in the system from your management company that's that late, then you're going to get a state noncompliance. You're going to get a letter, and we're going to let you know this cannot continue. You can be put, you know, taken off the approved management list if this continues. So we do try to let you know that it is state noncompliance, and we give you warnings. However, at the end of the year, if it's been consistent that you guys have been late and things haven't been done correctly, then at that point you can be taken off the approved management list. So tips for success, print that activity report that I just showed you. Make sure you're updating vacancy and referral in real time per any guidelines. Entering events timely, your move-ins, research updates per your requirements in RCRS. I can't stress to you guys enough, get that stuff uploaded. Again, if there's errors, we got time to catch it if you've sent it in 60 days before it's due. We got plenty of time. 
Um, but if you don't and you hold it or forget it and months later you send it, it's, it's on you. Um, it says use your resources. You've got the targeting program manual. And at the beginning of this, we showed you where that, those documents were. You can pull that to look at it. It's, it's on our website. Asset Management Compliance Manual, again, that's new, but that's on our website. Project Activity Reports, um, that's a resource that I just told you about. And then I have remember, because this is my favorite saying, when in doubt, please reach out. We are here, again, we're partners. We want to see everybody succeed. Um, if you reach out via email, I'll try to answer you in email. If you need to talk to me, I'm going to call you back. Sometimes you guys call me, you miss me because I'm on the other line, and you leave a message. If it goes to my, because what happens is my work phone calls my personal phone. And if I'm on that line, you automatically get sent to, uh, to voicemail. I don't check that like I should. <laughs> so the best thing for you to do is send me an email, because I check those constantly. Even when I was standing up here, I was looking at my emails. Um, I do try to respond to you within the same day. If I'm on vacation, I try so hard, Lord. I try so hard to make sure that I put down that I'm out and to contact um, Sandy or Amy or I give you a couple of people. But again, we're here for you. We're here to assist. If you have questions, reach out. Um, and this tells you how to get to the targeted program manual. This gives you a list of us, Sandy, if the key rental assistance set up because she works with that with new properties, file process, key assistance, billings or payment issues, you guys reach out to me. Targeted unit agreements is also Sandy. If it's vacancy and referral, DHHS, that's in further up in the book. And does anybody have any questions? No. Okay, we do thank you. Appreciate you taking this training today. One thing I want to say, you will get an email that says survey. Please make sure that you complete it. If you don't, you do not get a certificate. And now this training is a required training. So in order to get your certificate, make sure you fill out the survey. Sandy, when they complete the survey, do they automatically get sent the certificate? Um, so once you guys fill out the certificate, you'll get the, I mean, once you fill out the survey, you'll get the certificate. If for some reason you fill it out, you don't get it, let us know, um, and we'll check into it. Um, and I think that's everything, isn't it? And again, thank you so much for um, being here today and for joining us. We appreciate it.